Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we're going to call this uh, meeting to order. It's, it's the, excuse me for one second. Uh, this is the notice for the uh, public hearing for the expenditures of the American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA distribution uh, and the use of the federal grant funds received by the town. Um, so, this first part will be the public comment part. What we'll be doing is um, I will initially be uh, letting you know of email or letter correspondence that we received. Then I will open it up to public comment and we'll go line by line through the um, proposal. We'll go line by line through that where people have a comment. You're going to come to the lectern, identify yourself so that uh, we can record your name and address for the record and uh, then make a public comment. Um, we will try and uh, get through everything. At the end of that, I will open it up to any other public comments relative to the ARPA funds uh, so that if there is something that is not in here, someone is here to talk about or request for the ARPA funds, they have that opportunity at the end of that. We'll close the public comment, we'll close this meeting, and then we'll start the special meeting of the Board of Finance where we will deliberate the uh, funds for the ARPA expenditures. Okay, given that. Okay, we received seven letters in in support of the Mystic Noink Library. Uh, they're uh, very similar in nature. One was from Sarah Lathrop of Mystic Connecticut. One was from Sharon Barrett of Mystic Connecticut. One was from Francis Hoffman of Mystic Connecticut. One was from Barbara Washburn of Mystic Connecticut. One was from Kay Tower of Mystic Connecticut. And then Sally Solancy from Mystic Connecticut. Those six, um, all seven of these were circulated to all board finance members as well as uh, staff. They'll be recorded as part of the minutes. All six of those were in great support of the Mystic Noink Library. The seventh one we received was from Owen Hughes of Mystic Connecticut. He was in support of all libraries, uh, but especially the Mystic Noink Library, and was requesting the funding for the Mystic Noink to be $25,000. And then, based on the formula that was developed, the other ones received funding commensurate with that, um, with that level. Um, additionally, we received two letters, one from Peggy Brissett from Stonington and one from Nancy Brown Hughes of Stonington in support of the request to fund for all of the libraries, not any one in particular. And finally, we received an email from, uh, in, from Bruce Flax of the Greater Mystic Chamber of Commerce in support of the request from the Ocean Community Chamber of Commerce. That is the correspondence that we received in advance of this meeting. Like I said, copies of all these staff has will be attached to the minutes um, of the meeting. With that, I will open up this to public comment at this time. Um, and we'll start line by line. First line that we will open it up for is the Town Hall HVAC upgrade. Is there anyone who would like to comment on that? Okay, seeing nothing. Next is the Human Services HVAC upgrade. Is there anyone who would like to comment on that? Tim, just a bit, we're here for questions for deliberation. I'm here for myself and everybody, but you won't give me We're anticipating this will work like a budget session where we have public comment, we'll take the input, and then we know staff and other members of the community are here to represent some of these groups. As needed, we will ask questions. Um, I will say as we get into agencies that are not town hall employees, if you could just raise your hand if you're here representing them, if you don't want to make a public comment so we know who is in attendance so that we can uh, be sure if you have a question, you can just call it. that work? Okay. Uh, next is the Salt Dome at Town Hall. Anyone want to comment on that? Stonington Middle, the HVAC, anyone want to comment on that? Uh, water line loop. Anyone here to comment on that? Sure. I missed number six. Oh, 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 okay. You're good. Keep on. Okay. Right. What's up? 
Hang on a second. What are you looking at? I, ha I have the I have the printout that was on the town website. <clears throat> you have that slightly older version. <laughs> <laughs> the number version. Yeah, on the town website. Yeah. Is what I have printed out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Anyone else in the water line loop?
when you suddenly find yourself faced with only one income or an expensive health care need for COVID hits, and you have new unexpected health or child care costs or construction costs have gone up. There are so many scenarios in which people, through no fault of their own, need funds to make home repairs. Doing this now not only addresses the challenge that is in front of us now and is only anticipated to get worse, it also gives us a chance to start this program on our own, to do it in a way with less bureaucracy, allowing us to get the program off the ground and worked out before we potentially go to tap into state funds. I believe this is a smart and effective way to start with a smaller pilot that we can get off the ground and work in. Echo, like others who provide this type of work, would charge a 12% fee for their service. So whatever amount we give to this program, that is their cost. We have vetted this with our internal team so we know we can absorb the additional aspects of this work. In closing, I ask that you remember how hard it can be to quantify the value of helping to meet housing challenges. There are so many interconnected issues with this challenge before us, and hope tonight we can all see the bigger picture and the benefit of being proactive. I can make 300,000 work. I can make 100,000 work. I can't work with zero. So I hope you consider that. Thank you. Good evening. Leanne Theodore, 36 Door Road, Fox Tech, Connecticut, also representing the Human Services Department this evening. And again, just reiterating what our church staff really spoke about in regards to the housing, housing rehabilitation loan and grant programs. Um, at Human Services, we encounter many requests throughout the year uh, for different health care, home repairs, different things that um, a lot of times we just can't even I gave up. No matter how many community partners you have to partner with, when somebody needs a new roof, a septic replacement, new windows, installation blown in, it's just things that are above and beyond what our department um, can handle. In trying to get some actual research for you, I found a housing rehabilitation and building grant program study conducted by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in 2019. Basically, it talks about the expected beneficial outcomes. Those outcomes include improved housing conditions, improved health outcomes, improved mental health. Other potential benefits include increased energy efficiency, reduced hospitalization, reduced absenteeism in school, improved neighborhood quality, and increased neighborhood stability. Um, in addition to the random calls that we get from residents that are just seeking assistance when maybe their roof starts leaking, we also get many referrals um, from time to time through the planning and zoning department for um, houses falling under the blight ordinance. We actually just helped a homeowner with mean, some landscaping. It was a road infestation. The neighborhood was up and running, was calling us up and us on a daily basis. Uh, it cost us nearly $3,000 to remediate the property in the way that it needed to be done. We were able to do that using partial general assistance funds and partial donations that we received through the social services um, division of our department. But the reality of it is, if a fund existed like this, and as Dan Helm really just said, it doesn't need to be $500,000, but I think if we can get our feet wet, pilot a program, it sets us up to be able to seek out grants to fund something like this in the future. Um, it sets us up to create a stable program and really um, secure our community partners. We do work closely with TVCCA, who has the weatherization program. That helps with a furnace replacement, uh, blowing insulation and such. But they only have so much money each year to support a set amount of households, and those households also have to meet the life of guidelines, which are very strict income standards that they must fall under. So if we have a senior or a local family that's just above those guidelines, the program is off limits for them. And again, we as a town, and even working with our partners, just do not have the funding to uh, meet these needs on our own this time. Thank you very much. Okay. Debbie Monica Downey, Selectman and Five Back Metro's Waste Stunnington. I also want to say a few words in support of the proposed housing fund. I know last meeting you had some questions and I wanted to expand a bit on the intent. We currently commit 2.3% of our town budget to social services, which is a very small amount when you compare, for instance, the 60.7% spent on education. COVID has hit the social service agencies and clients especially hard, and one of the intentions of this ARPA money is to help with these additional costs and lost income. The Housing Fund is an innovative pilot program, which is theoretically sustainable and can help existing town residents and taxpayers. This is also a way to preserve and document actually occurring affordable housing. I want to clarify that this isn't a welfare program. It's intended to fill a gap in existing services. Based on an examination of a similar long-time program in Broughton, the type of people being helped are those residents who are retired, 
widows and widowers, single parents and those on fixed incomes, people who fall in the gap between poverty level where services and assistance may be available and a sustainable income level. And although these people and families may not qualify for services available to those at the lower level, they're still forced to choose between fixing a leaking roof, replacing a boiler, abating a mold or lead paint problem, and by doing so, staying in their home, or buying food, paying medical bills while their home deteriorates around them. I know you raised the point that this program helps only a handful of families, but these are current residents and taxpayers, not someone moving into town to take advantage of the money. Each person or family that we can help stay in their home might help prevent a ripple effect in the more significant future costs to taxpayers associated with housing instability. A chronically homeless person costs taxpayers upwards of $35,000 annually. Poor housing quality is also a strong predictor of emotional and behavioral problems in low income youth. Children with housing instability are more likely to repeat a grade, get suspended, and have among the lowest academic performance in their class. They're less likely to graduate from high school and high school dropouts are three and a half times more likely than high school graduates to be arrested and over eight times more likely to go to jail or prison. So you can see the ripple in the costs. We envision, based on an evaluation of Brock and other towns' successful programs, a sustainable fund where we could loan up to $30,000 in trust free. And in return, the town would put an affordable housing deed restriction for the life of the loan. Many of these repairs cost less than $30,000, and the loans would reflect that. This is a proposal for a pilot program. If it is successful, we may be able to pursue other grants in the future. It's a one-time, not an annual request for funding. And even a portion of the request, say $100,000, would be enough to get it started. Thank you. I have something I'd like to comment about this um, line item as well. Um, this program, we're not inventing something new. This program has actually been around in the state of Connecticut for nearly 50 years. So it's been su very successful in other communities. And it's a fully sustainable project. The first two years are considered a pilot. After two years of successful implementation of the program, we can go to CDBG, Connecticut Development Block Grant, for additional funding. No additional personnel that would be needed as there's a third party entity called ECHO, Eastern Connecticut Housing Opportunities, that would vet the project and deem it worthy of funds. That, that the individual request and deem it worthy of funds. Um, the vice president of ECHO is actually a Stonington resident, which is also um, on the Stonington Housing Authority. These funds would help the most vulnerable homeowners by allowing them to stay in their homes. Um, I think the prior three told you about the need. Um, and uh, the last Board of Finance meeting when our request for the ARPA allocations um, was presented to you, there was a question about, based on max per home, how many people could this actually help? So I know there's been comments on how many people it could potentially benefit from this assistance. While the numbers may not be large, my question to you is, how does assisting one of us not assist all of us? Other comments on the Stoics and Housing Fund? Uh, Alice? Stonington Transportation Fund. Ocean Community Chamber of Commerce. Southeastern Connecticut Cultural Coalition. Public comment. Also a resident of Stonington, the Edo Drive. I just want to make a few points, um, uh, some data points, and then a, a clarification on what we could offer to the town of Stonington. Um, we serve all the towns in southeastern Connecticut and also all the towns uh, in the northeastern region as well as of this year. Um, just want to highlight 
one of the primary uses of our funding as laid out through the federal plan is the speeding of the recovery of the tourism, travel, and hospitality sectors, supporting industries that were particularly hard hit by the COVID-19 emergency and are just now beginning to mend. Um, a couple of points. Arts and culture in this town is a cornerstone to tourism. Uh, it is one of the largest in the region, if not the state. It's over one million visitors per, uh, just in the town alone of, of attractions that bring in over a million visitors a year. It's 20 million a year in tourism spending here in the town alone. Provides jobs, volunteer opportunities for hundreds of residents, public events of the thousands of events, and as I said, over a million tourists a year. We at the Cultural Coalition have 65 registered partner business, businesses here in the town of Stonington. Those are both for profit, non profit, and individual artists as well. Um, just a couple of key points also. In the state of Connecticut in 2020, uh, $2.4 billion in losses to the arts and cultural sector and the creative economy here. 56% were made unemployed by COVID in terms of creative workers, and 61% of creative businesses were severely impacted by COVID-19. That's just in 2020. Uh, we have not obviously completed the work on uh, 2021. It's still going. And as a note, we are now, uh, after having a fairly robust summer season for some businesses and organizations in the arts and cultural sector, they are now in downslide. Uh, the Delta variant and the increase has now brought them back into where artists and performers and musicians are canceling tours again. Uh, events are now pumping down. Uh, things are being canceled for the winter that were now rescheduled after a year and a half. So we are seeing that this not only is uh, recovery has not yet begun, but the, the actual pandemic and the impact continues for this industry. And this town suffers from a loss of tourism. Like I said, it was a very, fairly good summer for many, but not all organizations. What our organization has offered every town in our district, all 44 towns, is the ability for you all to take our dollars, invest them with us, and we would redistribute them into your community alone. So far, the city of Norwich, North Stonington, uh, have committed those funds, uh, half a million for the city of Norwich, North Stonington, 15,000. Uh, we're looking at uh, the borough of Stonington has also committed. Waterford, uh, Ledyard, New London, and four others have committed funds without utilizing our organization. We are not here necessarily to say who's us. We're just saying invest the money in arts and culture and tourism-based industries in this town. Uh, what we do is we offer you a way for us to, to redistribute that money uh, through a competitive grant process using national best practices on where and how funding should go. We don't dictate how the money should be used. We let the organizations put forth their needs as to where they need the money most in terms of recovery and long-term viability. Uh, so our plan would be to put the money, your money, back into use for the organizations here to apply for, and they would tell us how they would those needed. We would have a grand panel. We would utilize members here to determine whether or not that is out, you know, um, adequate, and we would make decisions based on, like I said, national best practices and what we know from this community about where the most need uh, and where the most impact has hit. So we uh, would like to invest 1% for all the towns. Uh, we'd like to see certainly at least 100,000, if not more. This is one of your, if not one of the top, hardest hit industries in this town by a long shot. Uh, so I'm just advocating that we consistently uh, fly back towards, one of, like I said, one of the top uh, ARPA rec recommendations was that this money be used for the tourism industry and the recovery of that industry that's one of the top noted industries to be helped with the funds. Other public comment on Southeastern Connecticut Cultural Coalition? Yeah. I just got a little bit of everyone else, not, not staying here uh, for more. Um, Mr. Chamber? Mental Health 911 campaign? Child care subsidy. Libraries. No, you all are here. <laughs> you like to make a comment, but I know you all are here. Okay. Um, New Heights program, man. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke in favor of the Can we have a name? And a request for New name? Heights. Hi. Yeah, move the mic up for me. Stand by? Yeah. Uh, what was his name? Oh, you can pull it out and hang on to it. I'll do that. 
Might not be memorable. So a couple weeks ago, I spoke in favor of the uh, wheelchair accessible van request for New Heights. I work for New Heights, and by extension of that, I work for Vista Life Innovations, a uh, provider of services for individuals with disabilities for third years. The wheelchair accessible van will let us access the community for our population. One of the questions that arose last time was how many people can be in the van, I guess, at one time. So I did bring a flyer that shows the setup internally. If I could approach, I could at least show you what the inside of a minivan would look like, again, not a mini bus, for those of you who remember my comments last time. If it's all right, I'd like to see inside how many people and what it would look like for wheelchair accessibility. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Those are the bottom piece here. So it's a minivan. That's the wheelchair since so the left on the side, but still a full of other things. I think that's trying to be a person that's not sure. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, come on, HVAC. Police dispatch. Good evening, uh, my name is Bob O'Shaughnessy. I'm the chairman of the Stonington Police Commission. I'm also tonight is co-chairman Bob Tabor. Um, we find this position very important. Uh, the communication between the public and the police officer is so important. Uh, that this, this is a position that the dispatcher fills, and by having this position, we'll be able to fund more dispatches, especially important during times of storms and other emergencies. So the police commission fully supports uh, this position. Uh, thank you. 
Any other comments on the police dispatch? <coughs> cyber Town Wide Cyber Security. Let's lay health district. Hi again, June Strunk, 45 New London Turnpike. I'm actually a board member of Ledge Light, and um, I'm just here to speak in support of this line item. They did not get any funding from the government in any of the, um, any of the rescue plans, um, and they worked tirelessly 24-7. So I'm just here, the night that the board of finance meeting that you had, our first selectman spoke, so um, the other two of us didn't have an opportunity to speak. So I'm just speaking absolutely in support of, of this funding for Ledge Light. Uh, they've really been here for us and for the entire region. Other comments about well, Ledge Light Health? SeaCog. Uh, <coughs> what's, what's, what's that uh, acronym? Southeastern Connecticut Council of Governors. Thank you. Southeastern Connecticut Council of Governors. I got it in here, but I just want to make sure we're clear to all of you. Okay. Um, and with that, I will open it up to any other comments that are pertinent to the expenditure of the ARPA funds from any public that are here. I would remind you that we're going to limit it to the ARPA funds, so if it's a current budget item that you have an issue, focus this on ARPA. Good evening. Now I'm batting for Pawkatuck Little League. <laughs> My name is Will Morrissey. Pawkatuck Little League is at 43 North Anguilla Road. And we are asking for a grant of $25,000 to make a drive-in movie theater in our parking lot. The Senior League this year successfully defended its state championship, beating Bristol 6-2 and 6-0. Next year, Little League International is reopening the New England and National Regional Championships again. And with 13 of 16 players returning, there's a good chance that our team will go to the New England region and funds will be needed and we're looking to raise funds. This year we started a golf tournament and we were able to bring in $11,000 the first year and we're looking forward to the second year. But not only admission from the car loads, the league can raise funds from selling ads before the movie starts and our concession stand will also be a big bonus. So we're looking to at least start the process. I'm not sure if this is the place or if there's another venue that we should be going to first, but Pocketuck Little League is proud of our state championship team, uh, two times running, and we think that next year the girls softball team will be doing very well too. So we have 37 teams this year, uh, 397 boys and girls are playing, and we're very proud of all of them. And if you could help us out, it would be much appreciated. Thank you. Anyone else like to make a comment about uh, our performance request or anything pertinent to that? Anyone else like to make a comment? I think I got to ask this. And for the third time, would anyone else like to make a public comment about this? All right, hearing none, we will now close the public comment session of this meeting and adjourn that meeting. Now I'd like to call the order of Board of Finance for a special meeting. <laughs> Uh, and this will be for the purpose of deliberation of the expenditure of the ARPA funds. Um, I apologize, folks, that we're all dealing on three or four different sets of um, lists of numbers. I think the only thing we can do is go down the list that um, was published for people, and we'll just have to cross-reference off what you have to go for that. I suggest we start line by line going down. I will remind all board members that this is our deliberations. So I'll remind people in the room. These are our deliberations. Um, please, if you've got a mic in front of you, make sure you turn it on before you speak so everyone in the room can hear you and we can record for the minutes. If we are going to ask you a question, we ask that you please come to the podium so that, uh, again, everyone can hear what you're saying. And it is the course of the minutes. No, June, you've had enough comments. <laughs> <laughs> 
What's the question, Jim? Just for clarification on my assumption, having been on the board of finance, you have different sets because you caucused. So maybe you had, you know, just because it's, we, we have one set. So maybe you didn't look up over Okay, all right. We're going off the one set that was published okay. for the meeting. Okay, thank you. All right. Going to jump right into town hall, HKAC. Chris, are you? Or, yeah, who, who wants to um, deliver the bad news? The honest. The honest. Well, it's not. <laughs> who wants to deliver the news? That's that. <laughs> um, good evening. My name is Barbara Tell, Director of Public Works for the Council Region. Can you put the mic on the board? It is on. You just got to put it close to you. We can turn it up uh, a little. Uh, so, back in 2019, we did a mechanical assessment of the uh, human services building. As a result of that assessment, we replaced the boiler. But at that time, we had an entire list of additional items that needed to be addressed. Uh, back in 2020, we then had and this was just a mechanical engineer doing a mechanical assessment of the town hall. Um, some of these items were um, providing fresh air into the second floor of the town hall, which had no duct work. So the estimates that we got from our mechanical engineer didn't involve an architect and didn't involve any of the logistics of moving, a consult uh, moving the staff around when we had to do work within office areas that were already filled with files, people, furniture, and now you're um, looking at bringing in contractors into a very, uh, you know, you're basically trying to do construction in a site that you can't when you're in town hall. And, uh, and back in 2020, we didn't have the fluctuation of COVID and uh, the cost for construction and the delay in fabrication of equipment, uh, parts, replacement parts. And I can tell you even from my experience this summer, although we've got a lot of paving done, a very reliable paving contractor that I worked with for the last seven years had delay in being able to do his work for us because of parts not coming in to repair his equipment. And so what we put together initially for this project and the estimate that we provided to Danielle was was an estimate that the town engineer and I put together, kind of based upon the bids that came in for the fresh air uh, provide provision for the middle floor of town hall. And uh, what we saw was actually the numbers on that bid came in about three times what that mechanical engineer estimated. So we put those numbers together and kind of estimated that three times what was shown in here, plus what it would cost for design or our numbers. Um, when this started coming to more of a fruition of possibility that we were getting the funding, we called on the services of Weston and Samson, who have a lot of experience in this, to look at our, uh, look at our evaluations from 2019 and 2020 and give us what they feel in this climate the cost for this work would be. And, uh, and they came back to us uh, just just this week with um, with a new estimate for town hall of 1.89 million and human services of 720,000 uh, to do those two projects. Um, we are at a, a planning level for this estimate. Um, I, I'm not, I'm actually, I, I don't know what position Danielle wants to take, but I can't say whether that's the price or not the price. I can't tell you whether it's going to be 1.2 million for town hall or 1.89 million until we get the project designed um, and we see what the bidding climate is. Um, all I know is that the systems in town hall and the systems in the human services building are past their useful life or close to past their useful life. Uh, the, structurally, the building is in very good condition, the uh, town hall building. We just replaced the windows in town hall. And 
So I recommend that the funding move forward with this project and, uh, and that the Board of Finance can make a decision as to whether they want to increase that number or whether uh, they, they would be willing to minimally give us what our original ask was so that we can proceed with the project in support of those buildings to support the employees working there and our services to the public. Yes, ma'am. Um, so we actually had built in a 15% overage charge for these projects because we thought we were being smart. So clearly, we woefully underestimated. I, I want to I want to clarify that was during the clock the saying, so, not, so we thought not the numbers that are in here now. That's right. So we thought about that, and 15% is obviously light, and so you can't even guarantee it will be done at a million eight. What can you cut out of that project if we fund it, but we can't complete it because it's three million dollars? There's a lot of Christmas cash floating around, supply and demand being what it is, the numbers are probably only going one way. Yeah. So I've spoken with the consultant that gave us the numbers, and there are there are many different components to the building that must be done. In town hall, we must replace the boiler. Uh, and so what we will do is we will look at all the items and prioritize them, and uh, and then they they had an idea that we basically put out a, um, a, a, a bid and then have alternate bid items so that we can, it's, it's almost like going to an all la carte menu where you you know you want the steak and that would be our boiler in town hall and then you have, and then you will, we will put it out and try and get a bid for, uh, for uh, upgrading the, the um, AC. We know we need fresh air so that would be you know, if we're out to dinner, we're going to get the steak and the potatoes. So that's the fresh air on the second floor, and that's the boiler replacement. And those are things that you must have. Those are the things that are priorities. Uh, we can slowly address the HVAC units, uh, where the, the coolant is no longer being manufactured for those units. Um, but right now, you know, we have a couple of years of leeway. Um, we, we haven't run into an issue with those where we, we've had to service them yet. And, and needed that coolant is no longer being manufactured. So I'm, I'm used to economizing. What <laughs> what 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 I make suggestion we tie together also the human services HVAC because that dealt with basically. So if that was funded at a different level, okay, now now you've identified what's gonna happen at town hall or how the all the parts can work, what about human services? Human services would be the same way. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I haven't looked at that report recently and exactly what needs to be done. Um, but I can tell you, everything in the facility is running, everything is working, they have air conditioning. Town Hall has air conditioning, Town Hall has heating. Um, human Services has air conditioning, Human Services has heating. Um, we don't have a reliable boiler, uh, it's, it's past its useful life. Um, we have the programming system in the town hall. There, there's so many components. The, to change the temperature in the town hall on the second floor of the air conditioning, I have to call in a service person from New England Mechanical to tie this computer up to a panel to change it a degree or two because the software and the hardware in that device to control our AC on the third floor is not compatible with the new computer software and operating system on our PCs. Right, that, that's that's town hall. I think you've been clear about we could we could all apart that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Human services, I want to know what kind of situation do we have there? I talked to Leanne earlier to, to get a handle on what the you know the units barely held together. Um, I think barely functional, but it's functional to a degree. So again, are we able to a la carte some of that? Because the numbers essentially don't. If we if we funded it at 340, do we make any improvement or is that not making any progress is what I'm asking. Well if you go through the report for human services, there's there's things like the air conditioning unit and uh, matching remote condensing units appear to have approximately five to eight years of useful life um, since their existing condition, air conditioning equipment utilizes R22 refrigerant. It's recommended 
that the equipment be replaced and upgraded in an environmental friendly and higher efficiency R410A refrigerant system within the next five to eight years. And so, so there's... So we could all apart it. So we could all apart it different things with this too. What? So, so we, we have time constraints on all of this. Do you have any idea as to whether or not there's going to be a contractor available to meet those constraints given the likely demand for all of this? I would recommend that we minimally, I, I don't know, I, I can't, I can't uh, know what the future is going to be. Uh, well, like I, today, I hold on just a second. If we, if today we said, okay, we're deploying the funds, go out and get the thing engineered. Do you have any idea of whether or not our current suppliers could actually fulfill a, a bid and, you know, put something on the roof? Yeah. You know, we have two years, I get it, but two years of what's going to happen here with the money that's floating around, everyone is going to be putting it into air conditioning, right? So we have to do it within two years and finish it within four, right? Yes. Well, we have, we have to, from what I've read the requirements, it seems that it has to be awarded and committed by 2004. Um, 2024. Sorry, 2024. And spent by 2004. So, right. Yeah. And so, you know, so that would give us three years for us to get it designed and committed with a contractor, which I, which I think is quite a bit of time. We, we also, when we look at these systems, we're going to have to work on the heating system at a different time than we're working on the air conditioning system. And so we're going to have to phase the work because uh, we, we either have the air conditioning running or the heating running. And so if we're changing components on the heating system, we're doing work on the heating system that will have to be doing, done during the summer. Um, when we're in there doing some work on uh, the project, we're going to have to move people out of their workspaces. We're going to have to rent trailers and move them into temporary work, just work locations uh, on the lawn of Town Hall is, is potentially what we're thinking of. There's going to be, this is a difficult project where we're going to have to shift people around um, to open up the space. Otherwise, we're going to have contractors there working in the evening, and I think it'll be, and I consulted this with the uh, contractor, or with the consultant, and uh, we think it'll actually be more cost effective to relocate offices and allow the contractor there to work during the day, um, than have them come in at night. Those costs included in the number of years? Yes. Like, but if I were a question, I mean, you, you commented that, that, you know, Town Hall, you felt, was structurally sound, just replaced the windows, and, I mean, it's, 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 not like it's a building we want to continue to invest in. Um, how about human services? Or I, I guess why, why, why I worry is, is it does seem like we're frequently talking about uh, needs for that, 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 that building. Um, I, you know, I mean, are you concerned about anything structurally with that? Or I, I just worry about spending another 720000 only to find out that, you know, we have foundational issues, or we got, you know, more leaky, or, or, or what, what, what's the overall health of that building? Actually, um, I see no evidence of any foundation issues, issues in that building. Um, and if you're asking, you know, why is the HVAC failing in that building or need replacement now, that building was uh, refurbished and human services moved into that facility after the police building was completed. Uh, and so the police facility, I think, has actually had its HVAC replaced since I've been here, or, or significant components of its HVAC replaced. Um, and, uh, and if you look at it, their, their building was brand new, and they've already gone in and done some of this work where human services was renovated after they moved out, and then they moved in to a facility that was part renovation part old HVAC equipment kind of tied together for their use. So, but structurally, I, I think that that building is sound. And uh, as soon as we get that roof replaced, um, it, you know, I, I haven't seen any issues. We even pulled the flooring up. And uh, we even see, you know, there's no cracking because it's a slab foundation. Um, there's walls are straight. It, okay. it's, it's, it's structurally pretty good. Okay. Director McCarthy, what's your highest priority? Is it the boiler in Town Hall or the AC? Which one writes first? The boiler in Town Hall. Uh, because if you lose 
AC, if you lose AC, your pipes are fine, you know, everything is fine. If you lose that boiler in town hall, uh, you, you lose the plumbing, you lose everything. Cost on the boiler? Do you have an idea? I, I do not. Um, right now, we look at the boiler in town hall, and, and we want to put in, um, we want to take the large boiler out and put two smaller units in for um, energy efficiency. And uh, and so, uh, you know, don't tell my uh, maintenance employee, but we're probably going to bust through the wall where his office, uh, where his desk is right now, so that we can um, have space to put in two boilers, have that efficiency, have the backup. And uh, and so I, I, you know, we haven't gotten that far in the you know the true evaluation of that cost. Thank you. So the ERB, the air exchange, or fresh air intake and whatnot, that requires a ductwork, mm -hmm. right? So that's all the disruption of possibly not changing out the mechanicals for the air conditioning? So the, the, ER separated? the ERC required um, that we put a, a, a air handling unit up in the attic space. Yeah. There is the hole up into the attic space was not large enough to put in any, the unit. And so we actually, that did require them to cut a hole in the ceiling of the town hall first uh, top floor lobby. And, um, and then pull ductwork down in different locations. I think there was uh, three locations where ductwork was going to come down through the third floor and, um, and come out into the second floor. So that it, it, so that it basically had a, you know, the, the train or, or the, the duct that it needed to pull the air through. There's nowhere else in the building for us to put in a, uh, an air handler. So let's focus on where it is, but if you, put, if you can get the air exchanger and you can get the boiler, the existing air conditioning systems that you have, which are basically split units or whatever they are outside, would still work, right? You yeah, just wouldn't be taking advantage of the duct work you put in for the air exchanger. Yeah, well, the, the air conditioning, the actually the, the top floor and the lower floor, have your standard air conditioning system with the with ductwork. The middle floor, since it has no ductwork, has split units in each office. Or, or um, for example, administrative services, you've got a main office with two employees, has a mini split, and then the director of administrative services has a separate office and they have another mini split. These mini splits have been added into that floor over time and they're all different ages. There's, there's just a sprinkling of mini splits all over the outside of the town hall. Other questions? Thank you. Do, we, do you guys want to keep over there for the cell phone? Any other questions on the cell phone? Um, in ask 
acting director Shettle uh, of the um, funding and what they spent outside of budgeted last year. They're putting $424,000 this year to RTUs on the rooftop at the Stonington High. They did $350,000 in energy efficiency and $571,389 in additional funding to cover PPE required for COVID. So my question is that they withdrawn, based on what you're saying, they withdrawn their request for the $1.4 million? No. They are, so what Representative Howard is trying to do is see if there's any funding he can achieve in the state. Senator Summers is introducing a bill, not specific to this, but that this may qualify for that bill potentially. So what they're trying to do is secure additional about $1.4 million in funding to try and figure out where, how they can get this all done. What's the timeline on planning that out? Uh, Representative Howard and Senator Summers' representative said by hopefully the end of October, hopefully they will know something about that. I guess another question, this one can be for you, um, <laughs> rather than the Board of Ed, is what is our timeline on finalizing this? Because it seems like there's a lot of unknowns, whether it's the, the, the town hall HVAC, whether it's the funding available for that, and it seems like perhaps we, would, we need more information before uh, deciding on how to utilize these funds. Unfortunately, it's kind of like um, a budget cycle where we're going with the best estimates we have. Everything we've got we think is good. Um, you know, Barbara and, and Chris just found that some of those weren't, but we think that's the only ones that are outstanding. But until we are, we know that we have funding to go forward, groups aren't going to quote it because, like Lynn said, there's 300,000 other places looking for HVAC, so they're not going to somewhere that doesn't have money that's ready to go. Okay. I'm just using that as an example, not the, you know. But I guess under the funding processes of this, my question is specifically, what is our deadline? Tonight. And if we don't, so if we don't approve something tonight, $5 million goes away. No, it doesn't go away. However, um, we have put out public notice, and so tonight is the night that we're going to finalize that so that it can go to a public meeting. That the selectmen, we're going to send it back to the selectmen tonight. They will send it to, um, they will take our recommendation to the public meeting. And what, and is, public meeting. what is mandating this sense of urgency? Because I certainly know other towns are not going at this speed, and it seems the, that if other towns are not going at this speed, and we have so many unknowns that have been brought to the, the sense whether it's, yeah, I finish my point, whether we have these unknowns, whether it's the funding that would be available for the Stonington Middle School. Or the, the cost of the town hall in front of us and why there is this sense of urgency. You know, I'm happy to speak to that. I mean, the whole part, I think we're getting a little away from the core point of all this. The ARCA funds were given to municipalities to spend with a sense of urgency. We already have money sitting in our accounts. We need to be spent. We're supposed to be infused as quickly as possible to help those struggling from COVID. The longer we delay, the more this gets extended out. Further, just to build on, I believe, my understanding when I took away from that meeting with the school was that they understood the ARPA funds were not the appropriate place for them to request that money. It wasn't like they formally withdrew it, we were welcome to discuss that habit, but they all left the understanding why they're not here, that they were going to explore by October, that October the state side says, no, there's really nothing here, then they're going to come back, full disclosure for the six, they're going to ask for it, but they're going to explore lots of different avenues. We also suggest that they go back to the Board of Ed and talk about other potential ways that they could fund more than just 50 percent. So I think it was a very productive and healthy conversation. I don't think anybody walked away like upset or frustrated. Um, Dr. Wright is very forthcoming saying, look, we want to ask this, but as long as you know this is the top priority, they were planning to do it immediately, would be until next summer anyways for this building. So there is some time. Which, look, again, but you, so you don't have a deadline. You're not saying, what you're saying a sense of urgency and as soon as possible. But you don't have a debt like we have because I, and it's just the unknowns, and, and that's what's I think to creating I struggled, I struggled with this until I switched from board of finance to this side. Everybody here works so hard; they're trying so hard to get these estimates. They're not going to get a real number until we have the money in hand and can go out to really get. They're working so hard to get the best numbers, but it's not going to be real even before COVID. They're not really so busy; they're not getting. They're not. We're not going to get the real thing. So we're giving the best estimate we can. But no matter what, like you said, we'll give you an extra three months. In three months' time, we're going to be that same place. We're not going to have the absolute final concrete number. But 
you know, we knew the H back was a particularly tricky one for our equipment because it would have been so much stronger than the estimates we saw for the drainage and paving. Um, the salt drill, we feel pretty confident in that number. The H back is a really tricky thing right now. It's the number one thing being asked all around the country. So that one's going to be, no matter what month you do this, it's going to be the same problem. I guess, I guess my concern then is. Well, let, me, let, me just, let me just address that too. The other problem is that. Uh, it's exactly what Danielle said. The clock's already ticking on the money, and we have residents in need. It is not just the HVAC, it is the entire program. I, I agree. So we have residents that need this money now. And we are a, not stopping the process. We're going to get something. But, but three million of this is, there's a lot of unknowns to it. I guess the, the second point I would make in regards to this is, and I know you're saying that you had meetings with the board that told them not to come to this meeting and that they weren't needed. Did you think that? Come No one said don't come. We must you said, have said Peter, was going Peter to asked me, Peter, only Peter, okay. only the facilities. Okay. That's it. Okay. So, but I guess you got her here. That's okay. only Peter because I think we know the system. All right. We didn't need the facilities back here. Okay. Well, then, I guess, I guess my question is, and my concern is, if we're, we're funding a town hall structure and we're not funding a school. And from, I, I, I brought that up at the last meeting, and I continue to have concerns with that, and I understand that there are issues regarding the board of finance and the, the, the board of head as far as transparency, as far as funding, but I do think that there are issues in the fact that we're moving forward on the town hall, the, the town hall, and we're not moving forward through this on the school. Um, the town hall, every is going to be for adults. Everyone there can choose to be vaccinated. Um, you know, in a middle school, you have a, a, a population that they can't even have access to the vaccines at this point. And it seems specifically in regards to the ARCA funds that, that that is where the funds should be projected. If we had a, a board of ed, and if Farouk, you want to get up and say that, that, that the board of ed is no longer looking for, and the department the, the, is no longer looking for that 1.4 million, then that changes it. Are you, you, is that accurate? Are they not looking for the 1.4 million? Full question for you in some sense, time part of Connecticut. I do support that you put the $1.4 million into the funds because I believe that the school system should have an upgrade, a working HVAC system, not an upgrade, because actually it does not work. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, I, I, would, have very, I would have a difficult time supporting these expenditures um, when you have children who are not being allocated the safe condition and we're doing it at the town hall. I would love to see both projects go through. And I would just say you'll have an opportunity to do that during the work I am like the preparation on the SIP on this year and they would still get the money to them in time. We both were allocated our club funding in separate buckets. And I believe for, for you know, it was probably unintended consequence, but to come in at the 11th hour with such a large request when they have their bucket, we have our bucket, which as you see also has a cover, outside agencies, infrastructure, police, everything, it, it, it feels like it, it shifted gears at the 11th hour. So I think everyone agreed to that at the meeting and they said, okay, we'll come back if we can't find state funding. I think like everybody left very cordial on the same page. So, and I think if they didn't feel like that, the room would be filled with PTO members and parents, and as has happened in the past, so I don't think they, they see the same urgency. Um, they think they're going to come back to the budget, so don't get me wrong, but they seem completely fine with understanding that the article would not be appropriate to come to this money. Well, we have a board of members saying that they do want the funds. Well, they, okay, let me be clear what Danielle is saying, because I was in the meeting too. They never said they don't want the funds. They never said that. What they said is, we want to work with you to figure out the mechanism of the fund, be it ARPA, be it state money, be it SIP money. We want to start sitting down and talking about that. Right. That's the point we're at right now. And, and I'll just point out the 11th hour. I mean, the 11th hour, we just doubled the cost of the projects. Well, so, I mean, we're, we're in, I mean, this is a fluid, this yeah. is a fluid process. And, okay. and, and again, I think the, the, the fact that you know that, that if there was more information as far as you know all I have is a board of members saying that they would like funding for middle school and we're cutting that completely out of the ARPA funds and you know thus far I haven't been convinced why those would be cut out versus other projects that would not jeopardize that number. So, well, yeah, maybe just a 
jump in. So, so Bob, I think I, in terms of, I, I do think this needs to be a priority as well. I, mean, I don't want to speak for the whole board, but, but I, I want to see this get done. Um, but I am, you know, I think as we all are, struggling a little bit in terms of how, how is it best funded? And if there is an opportunity, uh, you know, if Representative Summers or Howard can, can, can get us, you know, get us money, let, let, let's see that play out. So, so I guess where I'm at is, is not necessarily zeroing this out. I mean, I'd, I'd like to signal and send a strong signal that, that we want this done. Um, and, and, you know, so, so whether that's 50,000, 100,000, put, put something in there that, that's meaningful, uh, that, that you know, signals our commitment to, 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 to working with, you know, the Board of Ed to get it done. But by the same, you know, by the same token, wanting them, you know, forcing them to continue to pursue some of these other avenues, you know, for funding. So, so I don't necessarily want to zero it out, uh, um, you know, I, I, I know, but I want to make sure that we're, we're giving it ample time to figure out if there are other sources of funds that can contribute to the goal. And, and I would just, I would just say that when you're weighing the, the safety of the middle school children versus the, the, the work of the town hall <laughs> and being vaccinated and, and to do that, that the, you know, I would prioritize the middle school put the money towards that and then seek additional funding, whether it's SIP funding or other funding for the town hall project, which I believe is extremely worthwhile and that we should definitely focus on both of these are for funding. Yeah. I think what, what let, me, let me just say one other thing. The, the school's got 4.1 million funds. Again, if it's, if it's so, a transparency issue, then show me that they have the money to do this project and that there's been some sort of you know, uh, uh, misallocation of funds or there's a lack of transparency. But thus far, I haven't seen it. All I have is this in front of me. And based on this, I, I, I'm not comfortable just fund, not funding a kid's So let me get a sense of the board. Um, what are you, what's your guys' sense that you would like to do on this line? Because right now we seem to be in a circular path here. So we're not so you know, I just put out a proposal to put, put $100,000 in there. Uh, uh, six figures, it's meaningful. It's our, you know, we're committed to, to, to partnering with the Board of Ed to get it done. Um, but again, wanna, I want to see what other options uh, that they're able to take advantage of. And, you know, I'd like to also see some more transparency and full reconciliation of how they're spending almost their, their formula in COVID funding. So that, 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 that's what I was doing. Great. And I appreciate that. Wait, can, can, I, can, I, can I get a sense of the, the whole board, please? Yeah. Okay. You agree? What? Yeah, I want to do the same thing. I'd like to see the project, though, because I know it's going to come back every single year. However, I have zero idea what's going on with that 4.1 million. Or the other carriers wanting two funds or anything else. So once that's presented, if, you know, if there's a reasonable case that they're using the money, you know, reasonably, don't have enough, I'd like to work to figure out how to get it for them, but uh, I can't answer the question now because I don't, I don't know, I have no idea what they're doing with the funds. What? I would support sending a message, I concur with the members of our department, and Norman. I would like to have that, but I want to see you a spreadsheet line by line of what they've done for $4.1 million in the first two years. Of everything I got. There's no transparency. I want to see that before I commit any of the funds.
seems like the one point. So the, the idea is to keep those numbers as they are, despite all the unknowns that have been presented. And, I mean, I, I just don't understand how we're funding that, but then we're not funding the middle school. So I don't think we actually specifically. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we didn't actually put a formal proposal. We did not agree on anything for the first two. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we have No, we're discussing and getting further information from, from the individuals. That's yeah, a two big ones. <laughs> we should. We should. I mean, if we're going to get a number tonight, those seem to be the lines that we've got to deal with. Well, what's the reason there were those lines? This is a big one. So we're trying to get our arms around these one, two, two point five, four. Yeah, that are 2.5 million. We can get our arms around that when we want to do that. That's half the cost. Right. That's two. So that's what we're discussing right now. Right. So, and that's why I asked. Are and we have not finished any discussion on any of these ones. Right. So, so, I mean, what is the board's? That's what we're getting into right, right now. In regards to those ones. That's what we're getting into right now. Is so the right. inclination from the board is 100,000 for the stoning to middle page of that. I guess on that again, I would, I would not, I would not support that, and I think it's, I think it's inadequate. Okay. In response to it. Okay. So, um, we are, are. I don't believe Jim. Stop me if I'm wrong. We're not. Can we allocate it out the two different ways? All right. So, Dave put a proposal or a, a, a caveat to say, can we do twenty-five thousand for this and seventy-five for the other? Is that that's not how I wrote it. Is that how you said it? 25? 25. Yeah, I don't think we can either. That's what I wanted to ask Jim. That's, that's, that, that's what I wanted to make sure to ask Jim because the HVAC can clarify the it's in order. So I don't think we can do that, what you suggested with our funds. Okay. Okay. So or the funds need to be for HVAC for those systems or the others that we have identified. Okay. And, and and the only thing we can do is give them whatever we give them, and we can't put any restrictions or controls on that. No. So twenty-five thousand dollars. Okay. So I've got one member who. Does not believe we funded enough. I got two who are at 25 now. Um, I would support the 100,000 that Mike proposed. Um, I need to go to Lynn and to Deb. Where are you guys at? Deb's at 100. Yeah, I mean 100,000 is it's a big open invitation. It's a big open doorway to come and show us and demonstrate to people. So uh, do the 100,000. Um, okay. Because if I'm not mistaken about it is like sit when you move this money around, correct? Right? Uh, yes, there's just like sit we can make adjustments as as it moves. So yeah, so that hundred for me is dependent upon the transparency. So I'd start with that from there decide if it was necessary the necessity for an audit. Which I don't think it would cost seventy five thousand dollars anyway for that because it's fifty years over the town. So you know we can pay for that out of town funds. This current year budget, but I don't even know if we need it because if we give them the opportunity to demonstrate okay. what they've done with it, then, you know. so, I just, so we have board members, we have a majority vote to supply that line of hundred thousand um, dollars. Let's go up to the salt dome. Uh, wait, yeah, okay, let's go up to the salt dome. Um, that's it at six hundred thousand dollars. We've seen the pieces that are cracking off of that. What's the set? What you want? I just have a question about that because, again, it's a construction item. So, is it a reasonable number still? Barbara? Barbara, I'm curious. You think or is it 900,000? Yeah. like a salt dome that stores 75% of our salt for the entire year. That's what's recommended in the industry. So that would be a dome that could, um, actually it won't be a dome, it'll be a shed. Um, that will store about 11,100 tons. This shed will have um, basic concrete walls 
with, um, we think what's going to be the least expensive, although we have to look at what metal and wood roofs cost, um, would be a metal roof with kind of a fabric structure. And um, I, I wanted a salt dome that you could drive through, but the 600,000 is only going to be a salt dome that's large enough for a loader to go in, pull the salt out, and load the trucks outside. Um, DPW plans on doing all the excavation that's required for the salt dome. Uh, DPW can do all of the removal of the existing salt dome. And uh, that's why we feel that actually the number that we have is a pretty good number because we have a lot of in-house staff. My team is willing to pitch in and make it happen. And so this number really just funds the building. When's the last time you calculated that? When's yeah. the last time you calculated that 600,000? Because uh, the ARPA funds that are out there are flooding the market with cash or degrading purchasing power significantly, right? You know, really, we came up with the number by calling other towns and trying to get an idea of what they have spent on their salt domes in the past few years and uh, what their salt dome sizes are and, uh, and then um, came up on our number. We haven't contracted with uh, an architect or any, any professional with that expertise to come up with an exact number. Um, but, you know, the building is how fancy you make it and how many things you add on to it. And, um, and you know, really our, our existing salt dome is crumbling and we are just, we're looking for bare bones so that we can get a structure up there by winter of 2022 um, to hold the salt. Right now we can't fill our current salt dome all the way. Uh, because we don't want the salt up against the walls, which are spalling the concrete off. Yeah, I understand why you needed that. that that's fine. Okay. Any other questions from board members? Can we get a sense? Of you guys support? Support. I guess I'll just say that you know I, I support. I think it's an extremely worthwhile project. But all the votes, if we go through this line by line process, if I was going to choose, I would choose the to fund the middle school program. I would choose to fund the housing program. I would choose to fund the, um, the, 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 the child and family offices. Um, I mean, again, I think this is a worthwhile, but it's somewhat that we go through line by line rather than saying you approve this budget. I think it's, it's more of a, a difficult question to do. So, how do you it? If there was a redistribution in regards to the, to the town hall and human services, you know, this would certainly be a worthwhile project. But I think it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to set. You know, I mean, without having those large numbers. My team. So, thanks, Barbara. Barbara, thanks. We're good. We're good. Okay. We got. We got. No offense. We don't want to be here till midnight. Yeah. yeah. Um, Six hundred is in for that for salt dome. Let's go back up to the um, human services HVAC. Um, what's the sense for the three forty that's in there now? That'd be three hundred forty thousand, not three hundred forty bucks. <laughs> The thing that's concerning me about this is that as we, as we go down this process and we don't have any of the costs that we've seen that we've been in this in the last second, is that we're not encumbering ourselves to finish these things or do these things out of SIP money in year two or three from now. So, I, you know, I really, I, when I look at like Bob, I really don't know what to do with this stuff, but it sounds like town hall can be piecemeal, it sounds like human services can be piecemeal. But it still sounds like the numbers that are on this page need to go up. Well, I think they don't, the sense I got, and now I'm speaking as myself, I know I'm supposed to run the meeting more, but um, the sense I got was we could leave these numbers as is, and if we had SIP money, we could increase it that way and encumber that we get that done. But this at least gets us started down the path of doing something. So I don't think we have to fund the 1.89 or the 720,000. We could, I think there are two paths we could go with this one. We could either fund, let's say, the town hall HVAC and then push the human services to SIP, or we could fund both of them at the level they're at, presented by the budget, and then know that we're going to get parts of that, and then we'll see, once we get into the engineering and can spend money, then we can see what we get and whether we need to immediately do a SIP project. Because look at neither of these are going to get done before we've got another budget cycle going on. Well, 
or two or three. Or, so, or potentially two or three, depending on. But before you, before we commit to a number for this, can I just posit one idea? Yeah. So we got three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars in there for the drainage and paving and whatnot on, on the parking lot. Yeah. I'd like to hear one of the, somebody tell us whether they prefer that money get lumped into this if we're going to include that money that we get down to that line, or if they would really rather have these three projects standing on there. Um, because I'm concerned, I'm concerned about a number of things. One, this is a dead horse plan to do it every year. So we didn't know. Right? So if we wait three years or four years, when the rush dies down, it costs us half the money, probably. Two, that we don't start the projects that encumber us and tie our hands up with SIP going forward. But three, that, you know, that thing is in there, and if we're going to make a line on that decision now, we should maybe talk to them and figure out what's more important, the comfort of the building or the parking lot. What I would say is all of these have been long standing SIP items. Um, just that all of these have been long standing SIP items. So, I mean, it's really your decision at the end of the day. They're going to come back in the SIP. So, if you want to start carving away at it with the ARPA funds, I think about 80% of the ARPA funds that are before you are for these types of things with the hope that we're carving out SIP items for the next year or the next two years. But I think and I think you know, I understand Bob's point. Like some of these things kind of get at your heartstring, and you want to, and they, they don't seem as important, but they're just the basics that a town needs to function. So we we put off. I don't know. It has been like ten years for the town hall parking lot. Like it's beyond. Like it, you just can't use it anymore. I mean, it's it's down to the most basic level of safety issues, all these other things, but. It just has to get done. The salt line. We can't not salt the road. So there's these things that they're just part of the basic functioning. And I think that's why they've been put off so long because they they don't get the the notoriety that some of these other items do. But we have to do them. So I mean, it's really up to you at the end of the day. But just know we'll be back in January with the SIP with these as top rated A you know, B priority items. Um, they they all need to happen. But I get your point about the HVAC and it's a valid question. So. You know, we'll trust your guys' judgment on that. So maybe just a point of clarity here. So maybe we're talking about potential cost overruns, and you know, we're already hearing about estimates going up. Um, I guess I just want to, I'm making an assumption, I just want to confirm this is correct, that we can keep some sort of you know, line called contingency, uh, other priorities, uh, whatever, and, and that, that that can be part of the overall package that, that, that gets into the full number that we take. You know, now. That is correct. We don't have to encumber 100% of the funds. Right. We have to encumber them within by 2024. So, but if we don't have to do it tonight, we can leave the contingency line in it to the purview of the board. Right. I think that's a great idea. I'd like to ask Greg for the problem. Greg for the problem. Since you're the director of public works, <coughs> parking lot, which is a higher priority, HVAC or parking? Right. Heating. Heating is always number one. Number um, one, the heating. What's two? Well, I say number two is the salt dump. Well, I'm not even talking. I'm just talking about the parking lot or the HVAC. Salt dump is the deal we're doing. Um, what do you mean number two? HVAC, Town Hall, HVAC, Human Services, parking lot. What member freshman is trying to get at is if we increase the 1.2 that's in the in the packet now for the Town Hall HVAC, that may come at the expense of the parking lot. Would it be better to increase the line to the 1.2 to the 1.89, which is the current book, or keep it at the 1.2 and get the parking lot fixed. That's the correct solution. Whatever Director McGraw thinks is the highest priority. <laughs> All right. Well, if I'm speaking as a director and if I'm speaking for department efficiency, it's actually a hard choice because here's the issues with the town hall parking lot because of the pavement condition. Um, and the ups and downs, it makes it very hard to plow it, which makes it very hard to clear the snow and the ice, which creates a hazard for the employees and the public when they come to the building. However, if we get all the money to improve the HVAC system in the town hall, 
Um, that would be for me, for my efficiency with my staff, um, that would be a, a wonderful thing because I would now have a fully automated building with reliable components um, that I'm not chasing day after day to make things work. So HVAC is more important than fire. That's why I want to put some things. No, I don't, I don't think that's what I heard yeah, at all. Yeah, I was going to say Russian roulette. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can just, I, I, a couple of winters ago, we lost a pump for circulating um, a, an area of heat in the town hall. That resulted in me having to call in a contractor, um, provide additional power on the third floor, run extension cords down from the ceilings, and buy space heaters so that my pipes wouldn't freeze and the employees could work, albeit with sweaters and blankets on their laps. That was my second. Yeah. And that, that is the, and for us, that's an extra expense. Um, I had to hire a contractor to come in add the electrical, and then hire, hire the contractor in to come and remove the electrical. Um, and then it's all of the work just because we don't have a reliable heating system. And, um, and so those are the things that run in and, and kill my team's, you know, eat up my team's time and my efficiency in running my department. But if we fund it to 1.2 million, that gets a new boiler, that's your number one priority. That's what you said repeatedly. If we do it at 1.2, that still provides an opportunity that we might do 375 for the parking and increase the reliability of the heat in the building. If we do the 1.89, that probably knocks out the parking lot, in which case we have a safety and security issue in the winter months. That's correct. Sorry. 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 I, I do not know how much the boiler costs, um, and you know I'm in charge of salt domes, boilers, pavement, and um, we replaced a boiler a few years ago, and off my top of my head I can't remember how much it costs to replace a human services boiler. Um, and that's fine, I know there's a lot of moving parts.
Uh, Mike, is that, or I'll throw it out to everybody, does that mean for human services you recommend leaving it at the 340? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, 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 um, yeah. I mean, I, 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 it's another. I mean, that, that building drives me crazy, uh, <laughs> but uh, it doesn't well, sound like. Well, does a great job with it. He loves it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'll, I'll put it out there. Yeah, three forty on that line for the original. And Dave already said that he was uh, supportive of that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. Is your parking lot okay? Is your parking lot okay? All right, good. Who's back? I don't want to know. Let's stay focused here, folks. We've got a long, long way to go. Um, the Inclusion Foundation, the old mystic site, is in for 138,000. Um, we have representatives here. If any board member has questions, including um, for selectmen and representatives from the Inclusion uh, Foundation, members have questions. I, I just want to make sure. I heard June say this, but I think we said it previously um, that this 138,000 was to evaluate the site for uh, the um, sewer system. It's a pre agnostic of the use. Can I speak? I just uh, interrupted yeah, the yeah, So I uh, just uh, thank you for speaking in favor of the uh, line that's in the packet were developed by Ted DeSantos, Ted Cutler, and John Carl, so the engineer and the uh, construction manager and the architect. And so there isn't a line in the septic system specifically, but the whole design with the lines, that's going to be considered it. So it's not just the septic system, there's other areas in there that they would do. We know what it costs just to do the septic evaluation? Um, we actually met this morning as a team, so we're going to be blessed. We started this process before ARPA, so the team's been together for a while. Um, the estimates that we gave in those libraries are getting pretty tight. I went through them with Ted DeSantos, who's a partner with uh, Fuss and Neil, this morning. We felt very comfortable with uh, Your specific question, though, Michael, I think was the cost of a septic review. Yeah. I can't say that you know that exactly. Because part of that was taken out for later on in, in the, the detail of it yeah. would be actually, actually after this funding gets us to kind of concept, uh, I won't say design, but um, validation. Feasibility. Then there'd be, yeah, feasibility. I'm not a developer or an architect. Then there would be a design period. This only gets us to a certain point, and then we give that information back to the town. The officials would use that to try to take it further to the organization. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah, no, that helps. Yeah, uh, um, we had $75,000 in the lower part that you're not seeing. It's just not in this request. And that $75,000, I felt pretty comfortable for the septic to see. It's just not in this request. But, or am I calling any mistake? Yeah. No. No. Questions? You don't have it. I can take one. <laughs> and it's kind of for Danielle, which is this. Um, has the facilities committee, or Jim, I guess, the facilities committee, have they even assessed what it is town's yeah, so need for this building? Before, before we took all this, they, um, they did do like a whole our kind of informal sort of outreach. They did get two, they did help with houses, every, all that stuff, just like they did with um, West Broadstreet School. So they got two requests only, I think one that was for kind of well vetted and the facilities committee liked it, they vetted with neighbors, it was from the Stonington Housing Authority to do senior affordable housing in that location. They had a whole kind of very initial plan, but the thing that keeps getting stuck is sewer or septic. And then what is really pleased about that site, then um, we were lucky enough to connect here with Allen. He also is connected with them, like you said, like every, everybody wants to see this site redeveloped and whether it is for sort of senior affordable housing or inclusive housing for young adults and adults with different types of intellectual varying abilities. Um, it, that is still being kind of considered and talked about and goes through a whole time process, but we know no matter what, the state, the site is stuck and it's sitting there. You don't have the capacity internally to do the due diligence and the legwork to take this forward. So I mean, the funding 
is important, but even more so is that they're willing to take on this work and move it to that level two so that we could put on our RFP and really get the next thing going, but it's just stuck the minute we talk about the septic and sewer, nobody wants to spend any money, understandably, because they don't even know what's even feasible at the site. So this would just be that first phase, we're kind of giving some seed money, and then hopefully someone like Inclusion and the Stony Housing Authority would take it forward from there to do additional work to see it. But basically we need to take a little risk, put a little skin in the game if we want to move this property that we own, that we are paying money for now. But it's a foregone conclusion, it's going to be something that's off the tax rolls and not a sale or not reserved no, for that, that's what we wanted to discuss this too extensively because there is no specific, it will have to go through the entire process just like anything. Just using those as the two things that have come forward as potential uses when the facilities committee had reached out and we've been trying to reach out. But just like with other things, it would go through the whole process that we have to go through with town on land. So every, we get bids, hopefully, or requests for proposals that would be put out and people would come back with them. So it's not a foregone conclusion by any means what will be there. But it is a foregone conclusion that we're not going to move this site and we're going to keep paying for it and taking up public works time and our taxpayer money, pumping a leach field and dealing with a building that's deteriorating that we can't keep maintaining and it's just going to keep getting worse. It's actually a great question, and I appreciate that. Well, I, I, we don't know what the site's going to be able to hold or not yet. Um, the, the evolution of this, just so you know, is that we worked on a project for about five years in downtown Boston. And as part of that project, we kind of came to a mission centric. I, I, my dad was in the military, we're about mission, our foundation's about mission. And we, we met up with people that had the same mission and happened to coincide with the town's goals for affordable housing and everything else. So we just had a team together. And these, these people that are the presidents of these organizations are similar to myself and mission. So for pro bono work and some sweat, we already had done a bunch of research on two sites. One was actually in Blocked Up, one happened to be in Old Mystic. And we found out that the other organization had already started working with the town and we knew each other and had common interests. It was just a matter of which one of us had the time to kind of go forward and help manage the process. The intent is to manage the process with this group Give the information back to the town, and then from there, you know, I'm not sure, depending on what the analysis says and what the town's people say from there. We're just trying to you know, keep the mission moving forward. Is a prepackaged treatment plan on the horizon here, too, possible? Say that again, please. A prepackaged treatment plan. I don't know exactly what that means, but here's what I think it means. Um, when I was on the site and I did walk around it, I, when I knew that there's a septic issue tying in and all this type of stuff, I asked the folks that worked with me on this project. You know, can it be its own entity as far as the septic and the water? Because it certainly it can. And they, they felt comfortable that they could work on that design. Now, I can tell you that the amount that you might fund it, choose to fund it, will not cover the design of that. Ted DeSantis was very clear with that. There's just not money in there. We had more money in there to get to that point. But the reason we took it out is we felt that there were so many other great organizations that were you know, coming in front of you. We didn't want to overburden. The, and what we also didn't want to create a bias towards any one entity. So. Someone's going to have to come in and finish that work that we start, and they're going to have to put some skin in the game to do so. So, I assume we're not familiar with uh, these processes and how it works. Is there any risk that we're introducing here in, in going through this process in terms of the due diligence and boring holes in ground? And, and uh, I mean, what, 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 what's the we find something we don't like at that point. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I'm not the person to answer that because I'm not an attorney. I can tell you that the other site had uh, private parties involved, and I, it was a great use of potentially the town's money, quite frankly, I thought. But that's why we stopped there because there were private parties. So we thought if we were on site and find something that's not good for a private party, they wouldn't want us to find that, right? This is the town site. So I would relay that back to people that are in that field, not mine. My, my field is to serve people. Um, You know, I certainly wouldn't suggest before we did poke any holes, we would do, and it maybe included what's called a phase one environmental site assessment. It's, 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 and what that does is that looks and that tells you what is your business, what is your environmental risk, what is your business risk, you know. Did it use? It did, but did it used to be an old dry cleaner, for instance? And there may be some reason we might say, yeah, maybe not. But it is a town property, and it would be good to know that anyway. So that was a lot of development. Yeah. We went through that this morning as a team, and 
So the first one is headed up is a gentleman from Cross Mobile, Ted DeSantos, and that is, you clarified that line to me. So that, that assessment is in there. So the town will have that. Um, hopefully it comes out good for you. <laughs> yeah, he said anybody that would develop the property would want that, so it would be available. I just have one more question. Danielle, I mean, why can't somebody, this thing is marketed for sale, which it isn't. But if it were, why wouldn't that just be a contingency in a real estate contract that they figure out the septic system? Why are we going through all of this ahead of time to potentially land us on a pickle? You know, I think that we could, the recommendation from the facilities committee and their engagement with residents and others was that there was very specific concerns and uses that they wanted it to be or not be and how we look at it. Again, you know, I think to give some of these other people a fair shake, we could do this. I mean, we, could put that out there, but again, the process of selling land is extensive and cumbersome on the town and expensive versus doing kind of a, a land lease and going to a town meeting. Um, so again, the facilities committee, they didn't put something in a real estate listing out, but they did say they did extensive outreach, and those were the only two. I think the other proposal was from Thornton Arms, actually, but then I think it, it didn't come to fruition. So they didn't get any interested parties. Are you, are you saying that you've been on uh, no, no, not I said not on the but the no. facilities committee took it out. They said they had a couple of It would be good to put that on the tax rolls and, and not let a realtor look at it and let them get a close to the stuff. I think I'm going to hide the realtor. They consulted with the realtor about it. I do call that. I, I did go to the open houses and I did meet with that. Okay. I'm sorry. She said she did go to the open houses. There was a realtor involved, but it wasn't officially listed. I know they consulted with a realtor, but I don't know how far they got there, but that was part of their evaluation of what's a potential use of this site. And everything kept coming back to, there's no sewer, the septic tank is failing, you know, whatever the use is would need a new kind of waste treatment system. Well, not, not really, and that was pre-pandemic, because it's a lot of acreage. So if a developer wanted to come and put seven houses there and build seven separate, you know, septic systems, that goes on all over the place. So I know, well, the data that we're talking about has no bearing on the real estate market reality of today. So I know we'll, just a question. Um, yeah, no, and I know we won't see eye to eye on this, but we'll throw it out there just because the mentality that went into this is you know, we're looking at the POCD and we're looking at the needs that we have in town. And as Alan kind of touched on in some of our conversations about looking at where we have gaps of services and how we address residents, it's young adults and adults with intellectual disabilities or varying abilities, there, there's almost no housing for them. It's a huge crisis all over the country and storing here is no different. So this did come out. We have a town on site. We could potentially provide for a huge need that is there. Um, we met with Senator Summers. We met with um, Deidre uh, Tool, who did the special assistance um, in the school for a long time. We, we talked with a lot of different people. So I think this did come up as a need and kind of why we're looking at that and again against the needs of the town. But you know, if people didn't like that plan, then that's when we could get to it. But no matter what, we felt like we're just sitting there with it. If we could do this due diligence and at least have more informed decision making of what's available and not, then we could put it to residents to decide. Mr. Chair, you know Significant cost in HVAC is one of the priorities. Maybe this should be put off. Something else is a little bit of a cost. Yeah, I would support it. I just think $138,000 to effectively do a septic system study, which is what we're talking about for the benefit of the town, not for the other POCD needs and so on, um, is a lot of money. 
So I, I would either zero it or cut it significantly. Can I just clarify that this is not for a septic system? So if you look through the packet, and I can try to pull up, there's many lines in there. It's not just for a septic system. So, you know, I just want to clarify that. I'm, I'm absolutely fine because this is just something we're going to treat to be helpful if we do it. There's land records research, there's phase one, which is an environmental study, there's a land compilation survey, there's a vehicle, uh, sorry, vehicular and uh, pedestrian recommendations, which, by the way, the site mill, you got an issue there, right? Um, you got um, geotech forums, you got a building hazmat study, you've got land planning, you've got architectural concept and design, you have concept, uh, conceptual cost estimating, and uh, you have other items in there. This is not just for a septic system. So I just want to clarify. No, I, I know it isn't, the, but what I'm saying is that's, that's the, the limiting factor for any developer to come and build anything, whether it's for some kind of housing, stones and arms or a private development that stays on the tax rolls. And all I'm saying is we sort of went down this path with, I don't want to bring it up, something else yeah. in town that's blown up and whatnot. It just seems to me that we don't need to do all that work for somebody. You, you probably don't need to do it for somebody to get an interest party. I understand the comment, but I, I, I think that the, the missing piece in it on the fire would be, I think you could unlock the potential evaluation for the town if you had some information. And so right now the town doesn't have that information, and I don't know the processes for the town. This is only the second time I've been to in like 20 years. But the reality is, I don't think see things moving the town very quickly. I see them installed because people want things in their backyard and they talk about stuff because there's not enough information. I listened to Mr. Starter at the high school when he voted against the Campbell Grain building abatement, and the one thing I learned when he said was he didn't have enough information. This provides you with information, and information will be powerful for people to make decisions. So I think from that perspective, it's helpful. I guess. From my commercial company, um, this provides information, but it's information that any buyer would have to go through anyway. You're correct. You're correct. Yeah. Okay. If you have, I don't know if this, maybe the buyer's not going to go through this. You're going to have to go through this no matter what. Okay. So, there, there's a timeline, as I remember, on the. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe Tim, just follow on that. Yeah, again, not, not my area of expertise, but is there anything in that due diligence section? Um, I guess where I was at was, is, is there a way to kind of stage this? Or, you know, it sounds like we don't want to get into borings until we do that phase one land assessment, but is, is there anything in there that, that would make sense for the town to, to do? Um, because it either wants to market the property at a later date or the foundation, you know, uh, could, could benefit from that, that, that we would have to do that wouldn't be required in a standard real estate transaction. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, I don't understand why this is different than any other seven acre parcel that's, that has to conform to zoning. Sorry, I didn't hear it. I'm sorry. I don't, I'm having trouble understanding why it's different than any other seven acre parcel out there that somebody can come and look at that, you know, their concern principally is that it conforms to zoning. I mean, yeah. There's not, there's not been an industrial use on there, so there's no real reason to suspect that it's polluted by anything. I haven't seen, yeah, I haven't done a lot of building then. I've done a recent project in Blackduck, and I can tell you that um, depending on whom you get in there, you have a lot of nonprofits that are, I think there's a couple that are interested in the site, the soft cost would probably sink them. So if, if you can look at it from perspective that, you know, I'm just saying this, that if, if some of the soft costs are, are covered through the ARPA funds, which is specifically to try to help populations of people that have been hurt by COVID, which may be your elderly, maybe people with disabilities, people that might, you might find a site there, um, that could be helpful to move those projects forward. But you're right, um, with respect to like, it's not any different than any other seven acres, but town. And also, and I'll say what's different is there's not somebody lined up to buy it. Right? Yeah, I mean, there's not, yeah, there's right. not, there's not somebody lined up to, to, to buy it, and the potential impact of the project on something like this, according to the, to the report put out by the, by the town, is that we're going to have an affordable mixed income housing for seniors or other housing for neurodiverse. So, that's a big yeah, that's a, a work, you know, to be able to move the ball forward on a project of that nature for $138,000 with an established community organization, it seems like a worthwhile use and within 
can't say is, is it is specific, it is implementable, it's implementable within a time frame, and you know what it costs. That's a little different than maybe some of the requests, but I do understand that idea of pushing money towards one thing or another, and I'm not here to predict that in any way. Yeah, so my own thing was I very specifically asked that question, and I got a very different answer when we started going down on it. So this really is um, about doing kind of what Bob says. So, so long as we're clear on that, well, the town can choose to do whatever they want to do with it, but I can tell you the spirit of it came around because a lot of the requests kept us moving forward to try to do the diligence. But I think the clarification that like, one of you articulated better than I did is we want to give potential people who are interested, like these groups, the opportunity because as Al said, they don't have the money to do this type of thing that a private developer who just wants to build a single family subdivision might be able to come in and do. So we kind of want to level the playing field. And then once we get this level done, we, we can open it up and we can see who and what is interested and out there and kind of bring it back to the residents. But we just think we're, we're putting all these kind of other options at a disadvantage because they don't have that type of funding to access. So it's kind of a way to be sure we're, we're being fair, we're showing what really is the options out there, just to kind of clarify that. So, so do the first three items get you like to a natural break point and, and useful information. So if you do the land record research, the phase one assessment, and the land population survey, uh, I mean, if that was done earlier, that phase one land assessment informs you. You then take a step back, right? And you you, 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 you then assess whether or not you want to go to the boring phase. So it, well, it, it kind of feels to me like there's a, there should be some natural break point here yeah. for a de minimis amount of money. Can we get to that natural break Ex point? Excellent point, Michael. Thank you for making that point. And there is, and we, we, we had a much larger, but if you looked at the whole thing, what we did for the town and provided it to the, um, to the selected persons, was a line by line item that got it to the point of going to plan and zoning. What we did is yeah, 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 yeah. we then drilled yeah, all the way back to the ones that you see to get us to the point of kind of concept validation. So your question is a good one. The answer is no to your question because you asked about the first three line and it does not get us there. What you're looking at in your complete packet gets us there, which is $138,000. That's where I'm more confused then. Like, what, you know, that, that was saying earlier that, that that phase one land assessment then lets you kind of assess the whole situation. Do you, do I want to start, you know? Well, I think it's environmental. I'm not, a, I'm not a developer, but it, the environmental, I don't think will necessarily, if you don't do more research to tell you how many uh, houses can be put on there. The environmental is like there's something contaminated. Well, you would you know more. Yeah. 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 In answer to your question, the way the work is done, usually, yes, those things are done first. It's kind of in phases. That's the first phase. Right. And then you move ahead and you do environmental or geotechnical borings and you do that. Because you wouldn't do those until you had done those first three items. Right. So That's it what I'm is saying. possible it's to phase it like that. Yeah. 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 Point that you might not get someone like a nonprofit, whether they're a nonprofit or a smaller entity, to the point where they need to be able to say, Yeah, I want to bid on this project. Yeah, no, I, understand. I, guess, I guess my problem is if we're worried about smaller nonprofits and, and that, we have a building on the site that they're going to have to take down. We've got a building that they're going to have to build. If they don't have $139,000, they're not, they're not going to build on the site. So, I, are we really helping that out? Uh, or are we really just... We're just paying So I guess that's my problem, is that I don't see where we're really giving the not-profits and that a, a real big leg up where they're already, you know, they got to build a building. we got to build a building, we got to deal with it. I mean, I think there's a couple items that town would have to pay for anyway. We'd want to do a phase one. We probably would want to do a hazmat. What do we have So you think someone's going to come in and just... Everybody's zoning. They're going to accept the zoning subject. Nobody did anything that unless they had a reason to. That's been nothing but a school. I know. I've worked there. I wouldn't be old. They burned down. Well, the hazmat I'm talking about is asbestos. There's the hazmat. No, I'm talking about the building materials. So if you're going to take the building down. Yeah, because that's what I'm talking about when I say hazmat. That's the lead asbestos. Yeah. 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 I appreciate it. I do disagree with you, Tim, for the reason is because I've actually interviewed the other nonprofits that have asked me to continue this to move forward. And we have one out there that's right now that wants to get some funding to 
do a project when they can't do this. So I just wanted to screw with your perspective with the city. Zero meter to lack of knowledge of use. Zero. Mike? I, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's where we're going to end up, but I, but I, I think this foundation has done some tremendous stuff for, for the town, and, and, and I'm interested in continuing the dialogue. I'm just struggling a little bit right now tonight to know <laughs> with, with what are the priorities, and, and so I, I just wouldn't want the zero to be interpreted as we never, we, we never want to talk again. I think that's a fair, yeah. that's a fair, yeah, fair. I totally believe in the mission. I, I support that. It's just we have a heavy lift, and this is just please come back. It's just not the time. Anymore. We're here to serve you. We're not going to lift. All right. We're going to take your time. I have a question. Jim, if we end up getting through this and we have some sort of contingency and then we don't do a project, can we call the Yep. Back in? We have latitude that can do things. Right. Um, so it like it be, like yes. Yeah. Right. So they have to be working in consult with the selectmen. I think it's even with the first one. No, sorry, not first order. Should it be a dollar? I think it's data point maybe versus zero. I, I don't. This is not subject to the same regulations that the budget is. So I don't think we need to leave a dollar. We have this. But that's my sense. Yeah. It's, it's really what I'm looking for. Right? This is a project that I'd like to keep. On the short list, um, if we have oh, additional funds, there's additional funds available. Okay. Well, I think it's an appropriate project to fund this time. So I think we're going to zero that out at this point, Jim. Yeah. Um, but now, with the with the understanding that you know, don't go away. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate the, the the time. I do think though the, the reason that these organizations will not be in front of you is because of this getting zeroed out like that. It does send a message. I hear your words, but that's not actions, and I do appreciate it. Yeah, and, and it, that's, I mean, it's no, it's no insult to me. I, I'm yeah. just trying to help the other organizations. And it may be when we go to SIP this fall, which is going to happen in about a blink of an eye, it comes in as that. Okay? We're, all we're doing is out of funds, not overall Thank general funds. Respect and complete. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah. Do, you do you think a call or a vote? Do you think you want, okay, that was that was six to six to one, six to one vote, Jill. Yes. Okay. okay. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Channel family, Stillington office. Do you want to me to just read? Okay, so. I had a discussion with the first selectman about this who had consulted with uh, Nan about this and they think to start with they can do it in-house um, without the 200000 to build out the offices and stuff that this was. So to get the program up and running, we'll stay there, but it may come back up as part of the SIP project. It's, it's the where? comes to zero. Zero out of the 200000 any other questions from the ground? Yeah, essentially, we heard your feedback, and Anne and I agree that, and we know there's a lot of moving pieces. We don't, they always know if they're going to get the state funding. There are so many challenges that Anne and I will reach out to um, the head of child and family following this meeting and talk to them about could we start it through United for a weekend to work at Human Services, sharing that building, and trying to get Stony to Scrappy, as we call it now, <laughs> just trying to find ways to still serve this community. But understanding that we have the two years of construction costs being crazy, and I don't have a commitment from the General Assembly to actually fund this office yet. It, 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 I didn't want to let it go, but it, I get that it would get future possibly. We have spaces in our building that we can utilize, and if we can just coordinate better, we, we can have adjusted spaces to be more counseling areas, and we can, we can make something work to start it out. Perfect. Sure. Uh, you know, Okay, um, we are down to the water line loop. Chris, yeah, do you want to? 
Chris, I'm going to say that there's a lot of information out there, and some of it's right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chris Greenlaw, Engineering and Public Works, Tom Engineer. Uh, I put together a few talking points. Uh, as you know, it's a pretty large project. The project that started uh, was initiated before I got here. So, this project entails the design installation of a new 8 inch water line uh, to connect, create a loop between Green Haven and uh, Harry Wall. The water system is owned by Westerly Water in Rhode Island, Connecticut. Their, their engineers that model the system are CNE. Anyone that does any work to the water system has to utilize CNE engineering to model the system. 2016, Buckduck Fire Department notified town officials of their concerns regarding the redundancy of the water system. Meaning redundancy meaning if the water line went down at the police station or prior to the police station with a loop from Mary Hall of Green Haven still be able to acquire water by fires. That's just one example of what redundancy is. In 2018, there was a Pawkatuck study of the water system uh, that was uh, CD design actually did the water study for the Pawkatuck area of water loop. Who, who commissioned that study? Excuse me? Who commissioned that study? I didn't know that was before me. I could find that out for you, but I didn't have a copy of the study, but I can tell you what the study found. It had identified sections of pipe with deficiencies, both for pressure and flow, and that's important in and redundancy. Pressure and flow being below recommended standards in accordance with AWWA, the American Water Works Association. Uh, this water line uh, installation would connect the two dead end lines on Green Haven. This is Green Haven. Mary Wall, there's, there's an opening here. Those water lines both go up both Route 1 and go back through westerly along Route 1. So we have, we have an opening. Uh, completing the loop or the provision of a loop would enhance both the pressure and flow for all the shareholders uh, within that pocket region. Uh, the report identifies who those shareholders are. Uh, some of the important ones being the police station as I mentioned. Uh, just what are, what are dead ended lines? So currently, the dead ended line, dead ended lines, end on Mary Hall and Green Haven. Uh, they create operational hazards for the fire department, business owners, as lower pressure flows are realized along with the lack of redundancies to normalize or restore flows. This year, uh, we solicited two very large firms. Uh, one a national firm and one an international firm, both with backgrounds in water and sewer. And those firms were provided proposal for engineering services to include survey, remember borings, that's very important, design, bid documents, construction, admin services, complete engineering design. A planning level estimate of these services combined with the anticipated construction costs is approximately total $2.9 million. That is for both loops. The loop from Green Haven to Mary Hall, and there's a spur that goes up Red A to connect to River Crest, which would be a benefit. Now, this had one of the engineering firms of the two that gave us proposals. Uh, all we have is a study. We do not have engineering plans, but they were very, one firm was gracious enough to take a look at the cost, try to give it market rate for where we are in this open environment. Their contingency, I know the committee member Young always looks at contingency, their contingency was 25% or roughly a half million dollars. I'm going to get back to borings. We do not have borings, uh, which is very important. So the wild part in this design is rock excavation or ledge. Hence, we all live and work in stones, and, and that is the wild part of the cost. And we just don't know exactly what we don't have a hard and fast cost on this project until we take warnings and know more about the ledge. Therefore, there's no guarantee on that cost. Although an option, or silver lining perhaps, an option would be to reduce the potential overage is to phase the construction. Perhaps look at that Green Haven and Mary Hall section, and then with a bit alternate to complete the A of the river crest, which is about 800 feet. Overall, the whole project would be over a mile. Phase it. You could have them look at phases. So if there was any potential 
when we refine through an engineering degree level of planning when an estimate, we could always go back and, and bid it as an alter. The uh, overall project roughly 5,900 feet, and again, uh, the extent of the rock excavation would become evident as part of a comprehensive design estimate. And uh, I wanted to emphasize that. Because currently we have a study that was produced by CD Engineering, which is the engineering firm for Westerly Water. And that study, um, we don't know what the contingency factor, there's no soft costs for engineering. So the engineers, two firms that gave us proposals. One gave us a very loose number for a, a total project cost at this time. But a couple of questions. First is, Bill Beauregard doesn't seem to have any clue about what this might cost. It's also, it's Westerly Waters Systems, whatever liability is in that report is shared by them, to the extent there is any. Chief wanted to talk to fire chief. Originally, his request was, and then he told me it was 1,250 feet that was going to connect Rivercrest through an A or Amy, you know, down to complete the loop on Greenhaven only. And then this report came about. So we've not contacted Westerly Water, formally request assistance with this. The Mary Hall thing, they say not. They say we've not formally requested they, assistance. They apply. We can. So we working with them to the point where we actually got them, much to their chagrin, to be the applicant to the state of Connecticut for a grant that we were trying to pursue a grant loan probably about six months ago. It was a very heavy lift. They went to their town manager, to the town council. They traced all the paperwork there to submit to the state of Connecticut. So we now we have numerous meetings with what well, they, they actually the have been trying to work with us on this project. and. Again, like I said, it, it wasn't easy to get them to be the applicant for the grant, so they did it. And then through the process, we found out that was not a viable option for us to pursue this, which is one that we then went to look for the federal grant. Okay, but still, they own the system, right? So the report that highlights the deficiencies is also their problem. The Mary Hall connection benefits a developer who wants to put a subdivision in there. What's his contribution, right? So there's a whole lot of unanswered questions in this, at least for me. But the last one I'll ask, and do not misinterpret this. Joe is around. Do not say this because I'm not saying it. I'm not opposed to the loop, but I have to ask the question as to why it should be town expenditures for a, pro for a water system that benefits a portion of the town where the other part of the town that has a private water company has to pay the rates for whatever they've got to do and so on. I can talk to just that last one and then Chris can jump in on it. I mean, I think this was a problem that was identified as Chris went through the whole chronology um, as a risk. And as he mentioned, we, just as one example, beyond our police station, the high school, which is our emergency shelter, is on this. So if something goes down and state law requires people to evacuate out of any kind of you know, housing facility, the one place we put them, we also can't put them. So that's why I believe chief firms first started bringing this to our attention beyond all these other things. There's a lot of moving pieces and risk for the town for not addressing this. So, it's not just about the people who are on this loop, it's about the broader impact for our emergency shelter, for our police station, for our schools, for Davis Standard, for some of our businesses that are on this loop. They all sent letters of support when we were looking for this federal remark. I think they all see there is a risk if the water goes down. Um, but also just to say, because you see how long we've been working, I think people keep butting heads, if you will, and trying to approach this from that, you should fund this and you should fund this. Westerly Water has unequivocally said to former first selectman Rob Simmons, to myself, to anyone who listens, they will not be paying for the loop. We think there's some wiggle room and conversations that can be had. As you know, we brought in Chuck Sheehan, who did this to the head of the Hartford region area for this, that there's things about the maintenance and improving the pipe for the flow that we could get them to do. That's why that's not in this estimate. It wasn't to see anyone. So we do think there's negotiating room, but for the pure extension, unless we want to go to court and take this and potentially or most likely lose, you know, the way Westerly Water works in Westerly, they bond for their water upgrades. So the town votes on it and they, they bond for them. So it's not how a fran works. They're two different companies and they have two different approaches. That's been what we've been having discussions about. I think you know, we can just keep locking heads over this or we tried to find a solution. It took a lot of time and effort to get here. We've got $1.9 on the table. And I would just say, if you don't feel like 
that full 600 or 900, as you mentioned, I would employ at least do if it was three, four feet, or whatever the design, engineering, bidding, permitting. So we can be ready when we get that federal money. We can look at it, see if it is enough. We can talk and work with you and see. But we think that should be enough. We may have to come back to the SIP. But, but there's a potential with that 340 for the design and engineering, but the 1.9 federal allocation could be enough to get the core part is maybe not both loops, but at least one loop back. So just, it wants to throw away so months Kevin, of work, but also $1.9 million. Yeah, but if Kevin Burns' solu original solution, which was projected to cost a million dollars, solved 90% of the problem. I, we have extensive conversations with Chief Burns and with Mr. Sheehan and with our colleague, maybe town engineer. And there's disagreements about the approach you put forward. If it's feasible, that is what it would cost. We've done the due diligence, the work, reached out to a ton of different professionals, as Chris said. These are the numbers that we have in the way that they see us addressing the loop. These are the two options. So that's kind of what's been put forward again. Can I ask a question? If you, if you don't fund the 600, you lose the 1.9? We don't really do the 340. I, I what's that? don't have the 340, the design and engineering. I don't know if that's right. Can you go to the light seat? Well, no, I'm not putting it. It's not a match, we just can't do it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, the, and Chris can speak to the exact number of the design and engineering. I, I am concerned that without the design and engineering money to get working on this and get moving and do everything, that we are putting that at risk. Um, I can't say certainly, as I think other people have pointed out, if they still haven't voted on it, they said they thought it would happen in October. Um, but I'm concerned about the design engineering money that we are putting something at risk. I don't think that's the same with the 600,000. I think we can come back to you and work with you to figure that part out. So the, three, the 340 is the floor to maintain the opportunity to get the one point out? No. The design engineering is going to roughly be between 320 and 350. Right. And, that's, and, that's, and that's the number that that's the number that would facilitate maintain, you know, being able to maintain the 1.9. That's just my my opinion, my best estimate. It's so hard to say. No, he's asking you a different question. He's asking you whether or not the 1.9 that we think Courtney has secured for us, and I say think because we don't have it in hand, is dependent upon having that engineering study done. And no, my understanding yeah. is it's not. No. It's not. It's not like a grant for a math. Oh. It's not like a grant or a map where we were required to put any money forward or to have it already that we said in the application it's not fully designed and engineered so that it was a very transparent process. My concern is that it won't be ready and we'll be able to execute on it and we won't, you know, if we don't start moving on this now and wait till the SIP and then have to wait two years. I mean, that is my concern. But no, thank you for the clarification. Started with uh, Bill Beauregard, which is a member of the West River Water team. And uh, I received that report from him. I want to emphasize that CE is their primary engineers. Uh, West really the town of, for instance, uh, there's no their regs. Anyone more than anyone proposes a project more than a subdivision of four houses. And with CE, they evaluate the model. So uh, that report I received from West River Water, so Bill Hunt does have that, and secondly, the information that perhaps the fire chief has in that study, there's charts with graphs of if you do certain phases and pieces, but again, it's at a study level, so when we're at a study level, we, it's, it's, it's not hard in engineering. You know, if we don't have the engineering cost built to that, we don't have more cost built into that, um, we don't have these modern numbers uh, as far as construction these days, we have a huge rider on Rock X, so um, there, there's a lot that goes into that. So the good news is when we, we have money for engineering, if we enter, um, if we accept one of these design proposals, built into the front end are meetings, meetings with town, meetings with agencies, meetings with stakeholders. And I can tell you from my experience, whether it's West Valley Water or from the Hartford area, whether there's a metropolitan district, sewer water authority, we would enter like a developer agreement 
if the town accepted this responsibility, not the decision. But if we did, we would have to build it to their standards, and that's what our that's what the engineers would do. They would have meetings with West River Water, and everyone would get off yet in stride with as far as what the specs are to build that water to the water line if they accepted that. And then who's got to own it and be responsible for it? Ultimately, my understanding is that it it goes back to West River Water because they are the custodians of the water sewer authority. So to speak. Uh, and I, I want to be very clear about something to everybody in this room. I'm not putting words in Chief Burns' mouth. He's more than capable of speaking for himself. But when I came away from discussing this with him, I came away with more unanswered questions than answers. So if somebody would be kind enough to send me that engineering report, I'd like to read it myself. Uh, he didn't have one to give me. Um, Other questions from members? Or are you? I don't know if this is 100% accurate, but I was just scrolling through past year's budgets, and in 2017 and 18, it looks like we had $50,000 yeah. that was allocated and spent yeah. for pocket dock water loops as it matches up. So I, I think the town is going to know the commission that. Because I'm sure. I, that's an yeah. assumption for just to try and. I'm sure we did. I'm sure we did. Who was the genesis behind it? Um, that's a little fuzzier memory, but I'm sure that we can. But I think it would be all of us to see it, to, you know, to know what the thing says, because there's a lot of info flying at us that the country And I think just to clarify what Chris said, though, don't take that study at the face. The more recent work that Chris has done is the more factual numbers. Chris, if, if you were to put a rough timeline on this whole thing, okay, engineering, let's assume all the money comes through, design, get approval from Westerly Water, I understand you've got to put a big, round, fuzzy number on that one. What do you think in time frame? Are we in jeopardy of the ARPA funds expiring in the time it may physically take to get this all done? Also assuming we get the one point. That's, that's what I said. Put all these assumptions, a lot of, a lot of assumptions. There's a better if, set, but So if we allocated the money, I would say, you know, we would begin designing immediately a survey or it's discussions with all the agencies to make sure it's going to get off the ground. And at the earliest, you know, later the next summer. You know, this is assuming also that we don't need any easements for working within the road right away. No other utility account for us. So I've been on that. That's usually where the water line is. I've been on the WPCA for 20 years, and I've never seen anything move that fast for these kinds of permits on approval ever. I mean, it took us 10 years to get a facilities plan done, and two of those years were spent while it sat on the desk with a consent order against us up at the So that's aggressive. So the question is the question is not whether we do it. The question is, is it really better served in sync? That's the question. So that we don't have the time constraints. I think it's not what the design and engineering needs to happen, and it can happen right away, so there's no risk putting at least the design and engineering, that 320 to 350 number, in here. And I think there is a big risk of not putting it in here and waiting for the SIP to take two years to come about, and then you could lose that 1.9. Well, what do you mean we're going to lose that? Not because we didn't do the engineering. If we don't have the 1.9, engineering time. was a waste of money. I think because there, and again, I have to go back and look at this, but if we're waiting three years to do the design and engineering stuff when the SIP comes about and we're finally doing it, you know, the, the expectation, I think, for a lot of year marks is you're close to trouble where you can move on it. So again, if you don't want to fund the whole thing, I think that's understandable and that, that's a point that could be well considered maybe this whole construction amount. We don't want to tie to the, the ARPA timeframe, but the design and engineering, I, I can't see any downside to putting it in there. It's coming out of the next, the next SIP budget and we need to start moving on and have to know are we really talking about this number? So we're, we're supposed to hear on the 1.9 relatively soon, right? Uh, uh, possibly October. Possibly October. Probably October. No. Maybe October. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully uh, before the end of the year, let's put it that way. And so so I guess under the assumption though that, that, that I mean if we don't get the 1.9 we're back to the drawing board, I'd say. Or, or, so again, yeah. you could do the line item transfer if you did 340 in here now, and for some reason we didn't get the 1.9, you could line item 
Yeah, I, I imagine there'd be some renewed debate as to the criticality at that, 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 that point, right? Uh, well, I think, I think to, if I can put words in your mouth, but I'm not going to try and put words in your mouth, I think the inverse is also true. We could hold off doing anything now and do a transfer once we find out that the so, yeah, here's where I'm nine is there, and then fund that quickly. Yeah, this is where I'm going. Is, is, is I'd like to find out about that 1.9, and, and what I prefer to do is create a big contingency line here. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. So, oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so make sure we have the 340 in contingency, you know, potentially in contingency here, so that if we find out in October or November that it's a go, you know, we got the 1.9, we can then, you know, tap into that, that 340 that's sitting in our contingency to make it happen. Uh, or if it's taking longer, then we just do it as part of the normal SIP, SIP process. But, but that gives us the flexibility to respond to uh, the situation, you know, the funding situation. Does that make sense? My thought would be that you have to prove you have emergency operations and you have emergency shelter who are all on this loop. It seems like a more um, structured commitment to the like, There's a lot of unknowns in many of these line items that as we've seen this evening. And so I, I'm not sure why this project in particular is where it, it will have to be developed at some point to get the design. I have a stronger commitment to the um, to the design portion that would be appropriate at this time, but I guess if we're gonna have a contingency fund to have it that this is gonna be a priority. But I, I would I would make a more uh, a larger commitment to it at this time. So vote that I got was six to bring it to zero and one to four with the caveat that there's a contingency large enough to cover the design build of the three twenty to three fifty. Three hundred and twenty thousand to three hundred and fifty thousand. <laughs> very careful these days. Um, and then Bob would like to fund it further. So can I ask one more and Linda would like more so I think given that, as long as we make sure that we get a contingency line into this that covers substantially more than the 325, is that all of the numbers? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Fourth District draining hall and paving for 150,000. I get a sense of the board on this one. Keep it. Or can I get a vote? Glenn recommends to keep it. Uh, Lynn. Fourth District vote. Keep it. Keep it, Mike. Concur. Deb. Okay, that was seven zero. Keep that up, funded as it is. Uh, town Hall drainage and parking lot. We had some that one already, correct? So that, let me get another vote just so we're clear on the 375,000 that. Deb, I'll start with you. Yes. Mike? Yes. Lynn? Yes. 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 So 7 0 to leave it at the 375,000. All right, um, sewer line for 150,000. This is the, as I remember, the second phase of the I and I study. Um, I happened to think about this in the middle of the night and asked um, Director Sullivan. Well, I know. Listen, I've got about 100,000 things to think about. Sleep is a problem. Um, I asked Director Sullivan if the bonding could potentially cover this because this seemed like a natural that would come out of the bonding. His answer, well, Jim, you gave me an affirmative. The bonding language was inclusive enough we could do this out of the bonding. Yeah, and hey, we didn't even do, you know, talk to the uh, facilities that you have. You gotta know the facilities project, you gotta know what you need to do. So yeah. Same thing. So the facility study for the WPCA could be done out of this, so. I moved to zero. Yeah. Yep. Mike? Yes. Okay. Okay. 
So it's seven zero to zero that out and the uh, W uh, of the bottom. Yep. Yeah. Um, radio microwave. Uh, this is the one the chief talked to us about. Do you want? Does anyone have any questions? I first have to apologize on behalf of this department for turning over the human services building to them. Way too much conversation about that. First about and the end. Sorry. It's on the record. We had had enough of it, that's what we were asking for. Another loop. She was, this is another loop that we talked about uh, before. The good thing about this, we actually have a number. $132,000 was the quote we had from the state of Connecticut. Uh, as we talked about earlier, I'm trying to do better uh, with that. We've had some further discussions this week with the state of Connecticut about the cost of that, uh, but it becomes very important. Again, the loop ended it, as we discussed. If, uh, the fiber is down, we are down, so we can get back up. And also 9-11 has some uh, issues that that fiber is down. So what it is is basically that redundancy that was talked about even more what a little bit this is from the communication point of view. We have a quote from the state of Connecticut, $132,000 and change. Uh, we're trying to do better than that. I think that is hopefully would be the ceiling on it at this point in time. So I would ask that it move forward and that be the ceiling. I would have to come back to you anyways with a bid waiver to talk further about who we would go with, etc. before we can move forward with the project. So if something goes sideways, we could have a different conversation and um, go from there. But I would highly recommend that we, we do that. We have the support of uh, our board of police commissioners that uh, have been involved in this and talked about it. And uh, it's something I think we, we need to move forward with. How often does it go down? Six times it's gone down. Okay. In one year? In a little over two years. Okay. It's okay. usually during a storm. It's usually caused by a tree or a power line that goes down and knocks the fiber out. Then we have to run around, causes the captain to get out of bed, go running in there, and do some funky things uh, yep. to get it back up online. So. Thank you. So okay. Our, our backup generator chief powers. Good. We had that replaced part of that for the uh, state grant uh, a number of years ago, so that's that's where it, that's where it's fine. So you just clarify, you said you're still negotiating with the state. Oh yeah. Okay. And, and are there any other potential sources of funding? Is there federal money for something like this? Uh, no, we haven't heard of any of the federal end of it right now, but we're we're trying to explore uh, getting the state to share some of the costs because of the quid pro quo. That's both the right. state and house. So yeah, no, I would hope that they would. There's a further conversation this week. I'm not sure it's going to fly, but uh, I'm thinking the 132 right now is hopefully going to be the ceiling. But we we'll still have some further negotiation, but that's a pretty good number at this point. And how long ago was the quote? Excuse me? How long ago was the quote? Ah, uh, that was from May. Okay. I'll say something, which is, it's apparent that one and all we're having a run on the bank here, right? Meaning we have a lot of requests with limited funds. I don't know if this is so. Well, I mean, I just think the reason being, though, that are maybe just to add to that, I'm telling you to concur, <laughs> yeah, yeah, is, is again, I, I, I'm curious as to what the state is really willing to do here. And, and, I mean, I'd like to keep the pressure on them, um, and you, quite frankly, <laughs> to, to, to negotiate the, the best deal possible. So, yeah, no, I mean, I'd be willing to defer as well uh, uh, in for a tight year. I mean, we'll look at the totals, I guess, here in a little bit, but uh, um, yeah, this is another one where uh, I think there's a possible, there are additional sources of funding that are, that are possible here, and I think if we just put it fully funded, then we lose that incentive. To, my, my only concern with a little bit of a delay, I don't think a month or two bothers anything. We start going six months or a year, we go through the SIM project process. We're looking right now at what, eight, nine months from now before the money becomes available. That 132 stuff, it's not a fine line, it's not going to get better with age. That's going up. And right now, the 
the state is pretty good about, okay, this is what it is, and they're talking to us right now, so hopefully we we're able to, you flicking something? Yeah, there's like a phone call. We're going to answer it. 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 So that would be my only concern to, to try and move this along. Again, it's gone down six times, so the clock ticks a little bit here on stuff like that. We know about it now. We know how to fix it pretty quick right now, but we would like to have this more of a robust and not have to worry about uh, uh, running into the PD in the middle of the night to, to flip some things on and change things around that we were not aware was going to happen with the system when we got Mike, Mike. There's still several weeks left of hurricane season. We have a winter coming. I, I would like to see us keep this. If we could get uh, some state money to get them to drop them the price, that would be wonderful. But I think it's important. I've worked my magic with them for a while, but I'm not sure I, I'm going to keep being able to go back to the well with that. But we, we had a little bit of a conversation through another party this week, but we'll see. Like I, I mentioned earlier in the early meeting about getting North Swannington to. Uh, not have to be worried on our end that that stay in the state because they were really going to have us just fund the whole thing. Yes. That's, uh, that's, that's not going to work. So. If I may, the, uh, the uh, negotiations with the state of Connecticut, um, we pushed them and pushed them, and it's more likely that they are to assist us with operational costs. If there is an operational cost with this um, each year, whether it's our rent on a tower in North Huntington and our rent on our tower. So um, they're more likely to uh, cover some of the operational costs, if not all of it, um, you know, moving forward. So that's what we're, we're also pushing them for, not only to uh, cover some of the costs, but also the operating costs. Do we have an idea what those operating costs are here right here? We don't. We, we, we have one rent right now that we, we pay on a facility that is not owned by us, but we, we lease uh, vertical real estate that's split with us about $150 a month uh, to do that. It's an antenna on a water tank in downtown Minnesota. So they, they talk that that's, that's from way back. It's more realistic, it's about like $300 a month, but we're trying to keep that in the state of Connecticut. So that they, they, they get that as part of their operation. This is all going to have to be worked out you know, before we agree to put it up, hire everybody, and do anything. So we, I would be coming back to you in a fairly short order with uh, a plan to do this, and then we're able to, if you guys say yes, we're off to the races, and, but we have a plan on how this will work and the costs associated with it to ensure that there are no surprises down the road. I guess given that, I'd, I'd rather put it in SIP with knowledge that if they get everything sooner, We've got a contingency that we do not have need for, we could yeah. pull out of that. So we've got an ability to maneuver quickly should it come up, but I'd rather, we've got, we've got a lot to get through. Well, we've got a lot to do, and you know, we're cutting social services kind of sharply here, and we've spent a lot of money on TV for CapEx and other things lately, so it's, it's also kind of parents thing to me. I realize we need it. I don't really know where it is. I don't really understand what the ramifications of six failures in two and a half years really is because I know there's cell phones. When you click your well, what, portable you, radio, you get it. Well, where, where is it? Is it? Is it a bunch of private houses? Can a cell phone not work? I mean, what happens when it occurs? When it occurs, what happens is our, our radio now is not, our antenna is not linked in with our surrounding antenna. It becomes basically a, um, uh, sends our antenna down, and now we're relying on two rotten in North Scarlington. So that means our radios and our cars work, our portable radios potentially may work in some areas if you have a pretty good line of sight to one of those towers. So if you're in downtown Mystic, you may be able to hit the rotten tower. If you're on Route 184, you may hit the North Scarlington tower. But if you're in downtown Quagata, or inside a building in, in a, a house in Quagata, and that, that link is down, you are not transmitting on your portable radio. The officer knows it right away because it makes a sound, it bombs its call. But that's what we end up dealing with, and that's what the captain goes in, switches some stuff around to make our antenna then back online for just ourselves, instead of pulling off the other antenna. So it's a network 
the network of antennas in the state of Connecticut that we jump off of. So when our microwave link goes down and gets cut off to the rest of the system, our antenna is down, it's down, it's not working. So we now have to rely on other antennas to, to jump off of until we get ours back up and it just is in that. That's what the state is saying. Can we just do a microwave link so it doesn't go down? Because it affects public safety not only for us, but the other agencies that are on that particular system that is now coming on our antenna. And so like the chief had mentioned as well, um, it's not just the radio system, it's also the, the fiber loop that goes in the entire state. And unfortunately, where that spoke, so if it breaks, we lose it. We also lose 911. So when we lose our 911, we actually transfer and ship all 911s to either drop the town or let their feed. So now they're answering our, answering our 911s and contacting us saying, you have an emergency here, this is where you need to go. Until that fire is brought back up. So it's not only going to cover our radio, but it's also going to cover our um, 911. It doesn't matter how we overlook this at the outset, but it is perplexing. What's the Is that What's that? What are you guys going to do? I get that you need it, but it is We still don't know where this is going to shake out. So let me get a formal vote on moving it to SIP with the caveat that we'll respond. As you continue negotiating, let us know. Yes. Right? Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Probably stay for Frank. You want to take it? That's right. Okay. And I'd like to move it to SIP. So vote is four to three to move it to SIP. Satisfy so it's not just a lottery. 
It's really hard to say. So I had actually had conversations with former playing director Jason Vincent and internist Sue Collins 10 years ago, way before she came to Stonington regarding this program. We've never advertised something like this, so it's, it's very difficult to say how many we would get. Anecdotally, we have at least, I would say, 10 to 15 calls a year um, in regards to people that are in crisis mode or refer to us through blight. That's a really low number. That's not realistic here. We would have a stunch application process that we would go by. Um, we would work closely with Sue to develop something that already our intake process, we collect all income sources, bank statements, we really vet out who we're providing assistance to to make sure that assistance is very much needed. Um, so it, it's really hard to say. I think we would get a lot more calls than we realize. I think there's a lot of lower income seniors that are struggling with smaller repairs, they just don't have the money to, to meet at this time and, and unfortunately end up moving out of their homes because of that. And when we're talking about a generation of trying to age more in place and save money in the long run, um, be more supportive of people in their homes, I, I um, respect the decision to start small and, and look forward to growing this program and getting some grants to move it forward. But if, the need, if the need is so much greater than the 150 and it is, you know, the 500 or more, I know we're up to 4 million, what is it that you say to all the disappointed people? I mean, there's, there's so much to do. It's, it's really hard to say, too. What is it? It's really hard to say. So some, some people might come to us with a need of $3,000 repair or even a $1,500 repair. And then you're escalating if you have a septic repair, okay? And people can't sell their homes a lot of times unless they repair their septic. And when we're talking about seniors that are trying to downsize, um, those repairs are much more expensive. And we would have to just take them as they come. And I think we would vet them out on a first-come, first-served basis based on their opening of the eligibility requirements that we put in place. But it's, it's really hard to say. Uh, I, I think, yeah, we would have to turn people away. And I think, too, if we could develop a waiting list, it gives us more of, a, of an advantage to apply for grants down the road because we're proving a community we need. We don't know that need until we advertise it and put it out there, unfortunately. It's what that point to say with everybody. We have a key part to any funding you give us. It builds our ability to go see other funds that are out there. We're at a disadvantage this point right now, but we don't have any data to share in terms of these types of let me pose this scenario to the both of you. I get a I need a septic system of twenty five thousand dollars. Okay, so I get a loan. I remember you saying in your earlier presentation two weeks ago that when they sign with a D, we now count this towards our affordable housing. But now they fix the fix the septic system so they can sell the house. As soon as they sell the house, goodbye affordable housing, you said, correct? So that's why once they repay the loan, they don't they repay the loan, obviously, because they're selling the house. No, that's what I mean. We get it back because we really gain nothing. But again, the affordable housing stuff is calculated on a yearly basis. So even if it's just one year, that, that helps us in that year. If you're looking at it from that perspective, or if it's five years or ten years, every single year it's recalculated and calibrated. So it, it does still help us with our, with our numbers. But I think the core of the point is we're helping residents here who are in need. And you know, I would take 150000 over nothing. I think we can you know, already is turning people away. So, we're not going to come back and say, oh my gosh, we need to go to the We're going to use this data to hopefully then be able to leverage whether it's state or private or other funding sources that are available. But we can't do that with them. So the, the senior we just helped with the landscaping, it was a white issue and a rat issue in the community. That was $2,800. We could have absolutely tap into this program instead of me using the town's general assistance fund to get that money back. Right. Yeah, but let's be clear. It's not going to make a dent in our affordable housing, our affordable housing percentage. Because it's going to be a larger number. Yeah, but even if, it's, even if it's 50 units, it isn't going to make a dent. It's going to stop a developer with 832. Every year it changes, but I think right now we need about, say, another it's like 430 units to hit the 10% threshold. Well, 10% is what they want us to do, but it's not a mandate. No, but to, to your question about the 832, if you want to be able to say, no, I don't want this year, I want to have more data, you have to hit the 10% threshold. So that's where, just trying to answer your point about the 832G question, the 10% threshold and to calculate the
with the board or with whatever else. I, I, I mean, I think it's accurate. That, I mean, they're, they're in, in regards to these dollar amounts, I mean, there's, just, there's significant data to support that more than, you know, 50 people can't withstand a $500 um, encumbrance. Um, and, and that sort of the situation we're in now, and COVID has just made that worse for people who were in that situation before. So here we have a program, like, and again, we're not out on the limb. I mean, this is a program that has been proven to be effective in other towns.
the Isidore, was it the night club in New York, whichever one it is. He, um, we go that route. Does it reduce the grants that we get for other projects here? I'm not sure. I'd actually have to check with Echo on that because they had actually pulled together our CDBG grant from the beginning. It's right now being managed by the United Way. So I would consult with them on that because we're actually not involved in Jim is involved in the finance management of that to a certain degree. But as far as the nuts and bolts of that project, I would have to check with my United Way contact. Right. So my, my next question is, uh, and, and again, I'm on board with the spirit of this, and, and, and I mean, I like the essence of it, but a number of, you see a number of questions and a number of comments have been around the logistics and, and how do we administer this and are there caps? And, 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 and I guess what I've been wondering is, is, is there someone else that can do this more effectively than, than, than us? Is there a way for us to channel money to, to another agency that, that does this? And can, can manage yeah, and that's what we do yeah. with that though. That's, that is what we're proposing essentially. Yeah, Human services are taking a, a piece of this because there are already doing some of this in consent to clientele to the extent that we want it that in. But then we would be handing this over to Echo, who's the expert in this, to actually be doing all that due diligence, getting the contractor, evaluating the work, being sure the home it, it is what they say they need. They just that they go into homes and they say, okay, you said you really need new windows, but there's a mold situation here. You have to agree to address this. Instead. And if they don't want to, then they walk away. They take away a few from the liabilities of the town. Unfortunately, they walk away. Right, so, on top of the administration, do they set policy? Can they, I mean, yeah, it, 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 it just seems like there's a lot to think through here. And, 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 and how do you audit on the back end uh, you know, with, with all this? Or, or maybe that is what Echo's doing. I think you know. that's what they, we have been working on a lot of yeah. this. And they, this is their expertise. It's also students' expertise. We just can't. Leverage all their expertise without saying we're actually going to fund this. Again, again like all these other things, it's a, we can't move forward until we know we have a commitment to funding. But we are going to pull the trigger with it. We're, we're committed, our staff, to the degree that is necessary to conduct the intakes and to vet out the initial paperwork to make sure the eligibility is checked before we hand it over to Echo. Because as Daniel was just mentioning, with their responsibilities would be that is above and beyond what our department has the capability to do or would do. All right, and my last question, sorry, is. A lot of the discussion has been around, and the examples have been shared around refurbishment. Um, whereas, if I understood the program properly, there's two parts. There's, there's, there's. My how it's right there. If you leave us only 150,000, we would only be doing the home loan part. We couldn't do both. So, with the idea of doing 250 for them, 250 for the down payment, yeah. or that assistance, like we have to. All right. So, them. at a lower level, you would just focus on the refurbishment. Uh, no. Pilot it and, and see if it's <coughs> not the amount of people we can help and then move forward from there. Yeah, it seems like those are two very different yeah. processes and And, and that's what came from Echo, because they're like, we, we do both for towns, so they're like, we can package it all under one thing and charge the same 12% fee and do both programs, but again, at 150, that wouldn't make sense, so we, we would just do the loan yeah. like the priority one that we're first exploring. All right, thank you. Other questions? Okay, yeah, um, let's get a vote on the 150 for the program. Verbally, please. Yeah, sorry, yes. <laughs> Mike? Uh, <laughs> can I caveat it? With, with, with it? This truly has to be a pilot. I, I mean, we, we have to assess this and, and, and have some sort of reporting back out. And, uh, um, I, so I don't know if that would come yeah. to Leanne's office or, 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 or we what. We also have to be doing this like, for the ARPA funds, anyways, like the reporting out and the audit and kind of that. But yeah, like Leanne's team is amazing at producing data. That would be part of what we're asking Echo to do. And again, like, Every month to your meeting, we give you an update on this one if you want me to, but we could definitely think there's a standing update um, in staff. In fact, it is supposed to be a private. That is the same part of the point of that. All right. Well, I'll say yes to the one Class, if you ask us to trust this, then so I will. I'll say yes to the one No. I'm a yes to the one yes. I, I propose that I better be. <laughs> yes to the one Okay, so we have a six to one vote in favor of that line for 150. 150,000. Okay. Um, Studies of transportation fund for 50,000. Um, I had a conversation with the first selectman, uh, and that I would like us to um, not create a transportation fund but make this a um, assessment or a, a contribution into our current fund that we use that we are already funding through Leanne, the general assistance fund. So um, if 
we can eliminate the main transportation fund and allocate it to the general assistance fund for the 50000 What is that? That's the, the we do every year through our budget that goes through Leanne's office to offer people help with uh, yeah. if they have. It's like the smaller piece of what we just talked about, where she can yeah. help you a little bit, and you guys really generously during COVID up that budget and yeah. utilized it. So we, we had been at 30000 for many years. It was up to 50000 And so adding this in would basically allow us to utilize that money for transportation. And over the past five years, we've spent about $30,000 on car repairs, transportation, car insurance, and things like that in general. So this would naturally fit right into what we're already doing for our intake process through the general system plan. But it's a one-time thing. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. One-time influx, thinking about the COVID variant. Uh, any questions? Deb? Yes. Yep. I was surprised you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we got to start every Board of Finance meeting after 10 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Cut off Yes. Okay, so we are unanimous 7 0 for um, that 50000 with the rename on that phone. All right, um, Ocean Community Chamber of Commerce is in for a 100,000. They should all get points for staying in the We're We're trying. We got a little bogged down, but we're trying. Um, questions on this one? No. They're, they're still here. This is here. No questions? What would you? 75. Okay, so I'm hearing people would like to cut that down to 75. Is that? Yes, for the 75. Yes, yes. Okay. okay. So, let's hit it 75. <laughs> See, Chief, that's, that's how you should react it. Scott, I didn't want to CT Cultural Coalition.
process of doing this ARPA funding is we actually would host these roundtables at the beginning to bring all the parties who, are, who, are, who need, who have need, bring them together to talk about how they can leverage their own dollars. What do you need? What do you need? What do you need? Can you all work together? Can you feed off each other? What does economic recovery look like? If you have an event, can you have events that same week? How about we market all of those? What do you need to do that? Um, but the idea is that they collaborate together to leverage every dollar to make one plus one equals five in terms of economic recovery. So that's part of our process of, of this, you know, that the cities that we've already engaged with, that we've already signed um, kind of contracts with, or moving, moving towards that, is that we would be the host to bring the organizations together. Where is the greatest need? How can we help them most? We're not telling them what they need. They tell us what they need. And we work together to try to figure out how we can actually make that actually boosted, leveraged, accelerate that recovery, work with other potential industries, and try to bring that money to the greatest fruition possible and impact. But $25,000, just to be honest with you, in terms of it's just not going to do what we want to do in terms of really spurring that kind of discussion. It's not enough of a carrot to really get them to come to the table and have enough um, uh, feedback in terms of the economic loss and recovery. And it's, it's not just about trying to put the band-aid on it. It is more about how they're going to do this moving forward and how every dollar can help them come out of this. They're not going to be stronger. It's going to take a long time. But anything we can do to help them in that recovery phase as we really go into fall and winter. That's the urgency part that Danielle talked about. Uh, summer was nice, um, but this is their heart. This is when they start to swirl their nuts and it's getting much for them. So it's different than other seasons that are off season? Uh, yeah, with COVID, uh, the yeah. people don't want to go indoors. So like I said, events are already being canceled right now that will reschedule after a 15 month hiatus. They brought them back on, they felt comfortable. They're now beginning to be canceled. But for the indoor performing arts, in the wintertime, that's all. Yeah, I mean, I know this Broadway just opened. Go the big line, always got a mask on, they don't really seem to care. But the next question I have for you, because I like economic multipliers, is you originally asked for 1%, that's $52,000. Um, we asked that of every municipality in the entire state actually got that. So we were kind of initiated that. Person. Right, so you got that. Could you do some good? Uh, well, we put in a grant with the federal government for a $500,000 match that we could then match ourselves and putting it in. So we're trying to leverage other dollars as it is. Thousand dollars. We asked for. I mean, the hundred thousand dollars would make a, in fact, a lot more would make a big difference. But fifty thousand dollars is it's it's not going to have a major impact in terms of, uh, of, of, of recovery efforts. Hundred thousand dollars would make a difference because you've got some local organizations who will come to the table for that, and it will give a grant more than five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars potentially to an organization who can do something with it, or a collaborative grant opportunity. We have four or five organizations who can go in for thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. So it sounds like you are trying to get some, to some sort of meaningful threshold. I guess maybe what was throwing me off is I thought I heard you say earlier during your presentation or your um, comment during the public uh, comment section is that you got basically 15,000 from North Stone. So, yeah, so yeah. 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 I'm honest with them. We have, they have one project of mine, but they've also offered us a way to come back in. They've said, go out and talk to the community, see what they're talking about, what are the ideas. If you feel that there's a project that needs more than 15,000, come back to us for their reserve, we would come back. We haven't really vetted what their projects that they have in mind yet. But we're not But Norwich is putting in a half a million dollars. Um, and that's a city that doesn't even have tourism as a major component. The recovery is so hard. In London is looking at anywhere from 250 to 500,000. And what about Groton? The city of Groton is looking at doing, they're looking at more project based projects, using their money for actual beautification projects in there. We've, uh, we've been asked to come in as advisor and project manager in place. We've offered every municipality three different options. One is pure grant administration. You don't want it to give the grants and be the process of putting out opportunities and letting them compete for them. We will do that for you with our expertise. The second part is a project management. You want to do some public art in your city, put a mural up, make it more beautiful, hire some artists, do something to put those artists back to work. Um, we would help you project manage on that. Um, we haven't heard of any ideas in Stonington that were in need of that. Um, and the third one was the customized approach where like Norwich took us up on saying, we have a lot of ideas, we're actually hiring a coordinator for the city, we're running a competitive grant program and doing two years worth of work for them that's customized at a half million dollars. But Town of Groton, not yet. Waterford has invested directly with the organizations. Uh, I think it was Ledger that's voting tonight on uh, our proposal. Um, and I think there's four other towns that are in play who have not made decisions yet. Look at the pie chart that Bob and others have reiterated once, like the economy kind of part, which was a huge focus of our but is tiny. Like over 80% is going to basically our SIP projects. Like 
they can just be true to the process to some extent that we can. And nothing is more than you know, the OSHA Community Chamber and the Cultural Coalition. I mean, these are two key things in the economy sector, and we're doing so little. And you know, I don't know if you take it from this larger contingency or from another you know, area, but you know, you know, we got 100 with the, we tried to get fair loans, and the 100 seemed fair loans, and I know we just had 75 fair, so I don't know, but the 25 seems unbelievable. Oh, I mean, I, I just, I'm, I'm sympathetic to doing something. Uh, uh, I, I'm curious to know why the original proposal was 1%, if, if that's not what you're comfortable living with. You know, it's funny because we were the first ones to come out of the gate with a percentage for the municipalities, and now everybody's asking for percentages, so we actually know that was a great model. 1% is actually based on federal and statewide policy called Percent for Art. Medicaid participates in this program where every municipal uh, state owned project has 1% of its budget that goes towards public art. Uh, so it's kind of a national, statewide policy around percent for it, that's a 1%. So it just seemed a reasonable ask in the beginning for this region, Eastern Connecticut. It was upwards of $60 million, potentially, when you started to add up some numbers in terms of what 1% could look like with some of the numbers that were coming in over the two-year period. So I guess if I sat down with 1%, it didn't much for Stonington versus Norwich, but they're 1%. We were adding it all up, yeah. right? We were adding it up, because it's just being messed up.
Mental health, 911, 211, that we all need right now. Yes. Yes. Uh, any, any questions on this one? Is this enough? Yeah, that's going for it. Just had a conversation with the chief. No, I mean, I think I'm talking about that. No, I mean, it's not enough, like, it's what to do, and I think I can tell them better. Well, we were able to parse it down. Please take your mask off. We're going to do it. I can't hear a thing. Well, we were able to parse it down to was this. Um, it gives her an extra part time counselor. Um, Again, we, we're trying to evaluate things and work with the team that's only been here since July, our new community outreach specialist. You know, we could be coming back to you guys to say things are awful in town, but like, this is the most basic. Now, this is a one time thing. event, sorry. You understand this is one time. Yeah, they're asking though, is it enough? So I'm saying, no, but well, we parsed it down because exactly it is the one time. And next year, this is not going to be. For right now, for we can mitigate our counseling wait list, and I think that's the biggest thing that we're looking at right now is for our free counseling services for town. We can use three more DMs in the <laughs> office right now. Um, she fielded 48 referrals just in the first month she was she was working with us. Um, but we were doing a lot of great things there, but we're not looking to you know bring in part time or full time people in that capacity. This is just to offer more free counseling hours at this time, especially with school starting back up. Our wait list starts to build a little bit more, so this would be really helpful. Um, to just cut back on, on the wait list and be able to serve more people for free services. How about uh, this from the board? Well, um, I right. recommend we fund it at this, and then um, you need it, come back. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Is that? That works. Good. 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 Good.
Next, we have the Como HVAC for $80,000. Uh, questions? How much does that actually cover of that? I mean, how far does that get, so to speak? So, uh, phase one, which is the phase that we have to have to do is the voice that's Sorry. 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 Okay. Phase one is uh, specific to our request to vote. Um, starting to Ashley, Monday night, I was at the borough meeting, um, and they awarded us $10,000 for some engineer fees, which is a 14 5 cost, so we're really pleased about that. Um, we have to move forward in this phase one no matter what. Um, and the actual full cost of that for the project is 186.5. Okay. Um, Any other questions, or do you want to go to vote? Yeah. Vote before we vote. 60. I'm hearing a lot of 60s. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Another table. Six, yeah. <laughs> I'll go 60. Yeah, I think this is the type of program that this is the program that you're using. You know, this is going to be in the app, but, you know, it's going to be in the quality during this period of time. So I, I would find would it.
Yeah, area I mean, is what's challenging for us. Uh, I mean, we do our best up here, but uh, is, is uh, I mean, I, I really don't have a great sense for the current you know, overall financial health of Tacoma right now, and, and, and you know how, how strong are the endowments. Uh, uh, I mean, I, 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 I see that. Uh, so, I, I can speak to that. So, the bulk of our endowment um, is specifically earmarked for um, scholarships. You'll see that we give out. Um, Barriers, probably about thirty to forty thousand dollars a year to um, starting to youth to go on to um, college, um, and then we have within that endowment, so it's about a million dollars with different funds that have been um, set up and become managers without fee um, to make sure more money is going towards younger children. Um, then we have a full fund line, which in that we have um, three months worth of operating expenses. Um, and, and has membership been fairly membership, strong? So when we, um, in, in this situation, it's like really broad and Peter they fall, you know, with the this project, um, because of the different competing um, infrastructure issues that we continue to address and successfully. Um, when we were closed for um, two and a half months, that was a loss of approximately $175,000 in program income. We did receive, um, and we kept people employed um, in order, and that was part of applying for the PPP funds. So we did receive um, just under, I just got from the employee, and um, two PPP funds, which we since um, received more forgiveness for, which we really pleased about, obviously. Um, and then when it comes to, you know, we were talking about fundraising and such, and Como were in constant fundraising mode. 50% of our, it's a 50-50, 50s program on um, fees, 50% is fundraising to get to about a $1.3 million budget um, annually. Um, the fundraising, we could not have a gala, um, and we now have pushing and pushing, and in two weeks we're having an outdoor uh, with have a ball, we're trying to utilize our, our resources and open resources and think creatively around this sort of program. Um, certainly people are getting away from wanting to congregate. But we was canceling our annual gala and because of our share couldn't be held, um, we lost seven thousand dollars um, just for that as well. I guess the, the additional context is very helpful. I'm also I hadn't fully appreciated the extent to which Human Services is also now <laughs> partnering yeah. Yeah, with the yeah, Tacoma. So. And, and I've also offered to uh, the first selectman that the Tacoma um, could be available at the auditorium for um, meetings such as this. It's a kind of forever looking for space. Um, and we're always welcome to support the time of that. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm just one dog with you. Seven zero three. Sixty. Yeah, we're gonna yeah. keep it at the selectman's recommendation of eighty thousand dollars for that. All right. Next is always home. Study to assistance fund for ten thousand dollars. Yeah. That's seven zero to leave that at ten thousand dollars. Uh, PNC Gazebo, that was recommended by the first selectman to bring to zero, so we'll zero that one this time. I don't want to jump ahead of you, Jim. You're good? Okay. Next is Edith K. Richmond PPE for $10,138. Seven zero in support of that for the ten thousand one hundred thirty eight dollars. This is the ambulances for nineteen thousand yeah, dollars. We we told we'd do it. So yeah. Yeah. Seven zero in support of the ambulances for the nineteen thousand. Next is the police dispatch for sixty five thousand. So it's really fifty eight thousand. I know what I, we can't. Yeah. So what I said was it's eighty 
28,000 fully loaded. Uh, as Glenn puts it, it's not a one and two year thing, so it's not an ARPA appropriate thing to me. It's an operating budget thing, so it should be in the regular budget. I know what you're going to tell us, I think, about <coughs> vacancies and whatnot and other needs to pay for it in this current um, budget cycle. Um, but that doesn't sway. I also partner with the column. <laughs>
they played it that night. But we had to wait till 20 after 9 because it was the second weekend of June and their, their screen is on the east side and the sun sets in the west. But we've got, if you've been to Proper Tuck Little League, our parking lot faces the west so we can have the screen on the west side. And we don't even can start, you know, even in the, the longest day of the year, we wouldn't have to wait till quite 9 o'clock to start the movies. Uh, and when we do have movies, we can start our, our season, baseball season, starts in April. And last year, we went and we played a game the day after the World Series ended. We ended up playing more games in 2020 than we did in 2019 because of all the COVID things. We ran a program and we had the you know, cleaning up everything and, and, and having the kids. But we had more kids come in because they couldn't play football. They couldn't play basketball. We had uh, had it set up so that we had our five fields. We were able to take care of all those kids and they, they were able to play. You know, so we're just we're just trying to you know take care of 400 kids that want to play baseball or softball, and we happen to have a very good senior who won the state championship this year and last year. You know, but they, they couldn't go to New England because COVID. They weren't having it this year, so next year they are. I'm already planning. I'm marketing director. I'm trying to raise money so that these kids, if, if they do a third year of winning the state championship, they can go to New England. We'll be able to take care of it. We're, We're just talking about this. This is a one time <laughs> shot. Building this thing. We're talking about that. We have to check. Please just ask me if there are any potential zoning regulations. Um, so I'm looking forward to look at that. Uh, we just try to do that if, tomorrow. If the screen faces the west, we got a bunch of houses that are, that are due downwind from where the screen would be facing. And so if you're starting at 9 o'clock at night, do we have any zoning regs that we got to be concerned about with the houses nearby? The noise is going to be 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 you know what the costs of movies are. I don't know. Okay. All right. Just it's just one thing to think board. about because it is, I think, I know that they did it on the, the government. Town. Yeah, it's copyright and. Um, we well, yeah, would know. You don't have to play brand new movies. No, I, I realize that, but, but it's it's for profit and it's large. We played, so the Stranger Murder uh, on, the, on the Green did it, and I don't remember, they had to get sponsorship, and I believe it was $300 for each movie, and it was like hook, and it was old movies for children. But it's just something, because it's again. But that's something like that, we could go get sponsors. Yeah. I just this this movie was sponsored by it. Consider that, yeah. You know, we've got yep. banks that are sponsoring the yeah. sponsoring teams, and we'll be able to say this movie was sponsored by so and so. And maybe the Ocean Chamber can help you with it. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah. That was surprising. They're old movies. We don't know how much money we have to do with the family. I think it's a fun idea. Yeah. It's good for the family. I think it's a ministry. Totally. Uh, I think it's getting people outside. I, you know, it would have been nice to have it earlier along in the process, but. Nonprofits get it at more of a discount. They get it at special prices for non for nonprofits. So I, you know, I mean, I, I do. I like the fact that now it's a little bit to make money. And, you know, and Bob likes it. I like it. So you guys are five hundred one c three. Pardon me. Are you a registered not for profit? Five hundred one c three. Yes. So and, and that was the thing about last year. We all the fields. So Brock couldn't play because of the municipal fields. You know, so we were able to, and we took kids in from a lot of places so that they could, could be so, outside. So I mean, I think, I think it's a neat thing, it's consistent with COVID, but, but I, I just wonder, is it, um, are we restricting access by just providing it to the Pocket Talk Willow League? I mean, is it something, you know, land still in? Oh, yeah. um, I mean, I'm just saying, is this something, what the advantage is, it's portable, I mean, I'm just reading how, like, you know, uh, at night it all goes in the box. It's something that human services should own, and we should be able to give it to 
any of the nonprofits that want to use it in town? Well, you know, I put the, the blow up screens in there, you know, because if you want to just write a check and get everything. But that first set, where you go and get everything on our own, and we build our own screen so that the screen is there, then, you know, it, it's, and that's again why I wasn't asking for 35. I was asking for 25, because if we can build our own screen that's, that stays there, then we save on the blow up screen. And quite frankly, with volunteers trying to put a blow up screen away every time, I'm just worried about having to catch a blow up screen. So we'd rather have it build, you know, the screen that's there. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to think how more people can benefit from this. You know, I'm trying to think how more more people can benefit from it rather than just being us funding this for the Park Dark World League and for own, no, use only by the Park Dark World League. Is, is there a way to make this available more broadly to, you know, what if the Mystic World League wants to use it or, 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 or that strike the high school group wants to do a, a charity event? Would you consider like collaborating for some of them? Come back when you 
it looks, but I think we should kick it in, in, in this, you know, contingent upon it. I mean, let's, let's, let's have something that is... I think it's in the contingency already well, if we have the 20. Well, that's what I there's more than enough to yet. Yeah. I think we've got a couple of these that we're going to hear back from yeah. the chief. We might hear back from... Right, we keep promising a bunch of people's stuff. So, I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to overextend our... So the zoning piece and, and the... Uh, how can other and nonprofits? And, and, and what's the process for us to decide to take it over? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Those two yeah. 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 Tell me how that's done. And how it's done. Yeah. Yeah. We look forward to your Great. Yeah. Right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Jeff, don't put everything away yet. Jeff, no, 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 where no. are we at right now? Because we did not do anything to pay in. I want to know where we're at. Okay. So right now, Danielle, Danielle, we got like two minutes, we got to finish it, and I can't hear Jim with you. Frank, what do you have paving at? You have paving zero right now? No, it would probably be the 115 if you publish that. What do you have at? Yes, like 115. 115. Jim, what's the contingency of all construction projects? Sorry, at least 15 of the 115. Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. Where are we at? We have unallocated funds of one million five hundred ninety-one thousand six hundred sixty-eight. One five nine one six six six. If you took fifteen percent of the overall funds we've got as a contingency, what's that number? It's half that. It's eight hundred thousand. Eight hundred. Seven hundred eighty. We can get these numbers tomorrow. Jim, would you repeat okay. Wait, okay. The Board of Finance has got to run this meeting right now, okay, because we're trying to finish up and, and we got too many people asking for numbers. So, Jim, 15% of the overall funds is how much money? 15% of the 5 million? Yes. yes. I believe it's 784, 639. So I'm not sure. 784, 639. Okay. So we that's roughly half of what we have on that allocated now. Correct. Uh, assuming that the seven eighty four six thirty nine that's fifteen percent on all the projects because we have three hundred and twenty K that we have to add to that unless we're gonna just roll that in. No, but the 320 on the yeah, but, but I'm good. I just want to make sure that we're, we're not losing the 320 that we said was going to be in contingency. I don't want to put that in the contingency. And that, and that takes it to a million. Yeah. Jim, can you repeat it? Hang on, because we'll, we're going to do it in one swoop, swift motion. We'll get to you. Okay. okay. I would like to add that into the paving the 591,668. That's enough. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's plus the one. Yeah. Plus the one. Yeah, that's going into that. So, eight or six. The total. Mike, are, Mike, are you okay with adding that in? Yep, yep. So we're at 806 for payment. So well, hang on. Let me get a vote first. Yes. 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 Okay. So six to one, we're going to add $591,668 to the paving line. Okay. Got that, Jim? Yep. 
So that should allocate all of the ARPA funds. Now, given all that, are we still compliant with the unrestricted fund limits and that? Yes. Okay. So we are still. So, is everyone comfortable with where we're at? As comfortable as we're going to be. Yeah, okay, we're comfortable with going to a vote on these funds. Jim, much like we've done the summary for the budget, could you give us a summary of the of, of everything of where we're at? By section or each line items? By section. Okay, so we're at the we're at three million two hundred and twenty thousand. Jim, can you speak up just a little bit more? Thank you. The facilities were at $3,240,000. Thanks. For infrastructure, we're at $1,231,668. Thank you. Thank you. For housing, we're at 150000 For transportation, well, it's actually now general assistance, we're at 50000 For economy, we're at 140000 For services, we're at $203,618. 203618 Security and health, we're at 181,309. It's 181,309. And for general assistance with grant administration, we're at 34,332. For a total of $5,230,927. Can you say services? Jim, where did the contingency line get it? I just threw it up into facilities. Facilities? So that's that, 2018. So there's nothing on services and facilities? All right, can I get a motion to send the recommendation to the ARPA funds in the dollars that Jim just outlined to be selected? A motion and a second. Is there any discussion about the motion? Yeah, I was about to say I'm going to vote against it because I think we're going in a phase that's unnecessary for the funds, and I also think that the HVAC program is pretty significant on unknown. And so I think I think more deliberation would be appropriate to actually assess the situation. Any other discussion? All in favor? Say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Any abstention? So by a vote of six to one, um, we approve the recommendation for those funds to be sent to the selectmen to send it to, to the public hearing. With that, Town meeting. we have no more business before the board. We are adjourned. Okay. That was fun. Was that fun? I'm in the